the director of the Latin American Business and Human Rights Scholars Association. It is a pleasure for me to join you in this Kharkiv Forum on Business. I'm very grateful to Olena Ovarova for her invitation uh, uh, to join this important event, this regional event, even though I cannot be uh, presently. Good morning. My name is Humberto Cantu Rivera. I'm the director of the Latin American Business and Human Rights. to thank in the development of business and human rights in Central and
Alô, alô. Раз, раз, два, проверка. Раз, два, три. Как там по уровню? Раз, два, три, четыре. Раз, два, раз. Идет, да? Почему нет? Раз, два, три. Только что шел. Раз. Я же там в динамиках звук слышу. Эхо. Раз. Идет? Сейчас он мне. Раз, раз. Так что? А, так что ж здесь, вот на вытащить. А что? Я же видел глупо, здесь прыгал. Здесь идет на вытащить, не что-то не слышит. Проверьте, потому что я видел, ориентировка буквально 15 минут назад про это обрезать. И где индикатор даже зашкаливал. Вот передопустите, что ты со мной видишь? Ух, я это точно знаю. У меня тут ничего не надо будет для тенчевки. Олег, ты тоже пиши.
Шановні колеги, ми раді вас вітати на початку серії заходів з бізнесу і прав людини у Східній і Центральній Європі. І, власне, сьогодні наш перший день роботи. Завтра ми також будемо плідно працювати. Завтра наш центральний захід, панельна дискусія. Ми працюємо, я відразу хочу спланувати ваш графік, з 9 до 6 вечора за київським часом. І я знаю, що вже до нас доєдналися учасники з різних регіонів. Тому комусь доброго ранку, комусь доброго дня, комусь доброго вечора а хтось навіть не спить заради нас зараз і заради участі в цих заходах. Сьогодні ми працюємо до сьомої вечора. Ті, хто з нами онлайн, будь ласка, слідкуйте за програмою, які заходи вам більше цікаві і ви завжди можете будь-якої миті доєднатися до нас. Я зараз хочу для вітальних слів надати слово абсолютно, особливому, абсолютно особливій людині в моєму житті. Це пан Юрій Барабаша, наш проректор. І це та людина, від якої ми найчастіше чуємо слова «Чим я можу допомогти?». І це надзвичайна підтримка, і ми вже четвертий рік проводимо харчування, Харківський міжнародний юридичний форум. І якби не ця підтримка, не дружній погляд, іноді просто не слова «ми все зможемо», навряд чи ми б вирішували кожного року знову провести цей шалений захід. Будь ласка, пане Юрію, вам слово. Дякую, пані Олена. Схоже, такий красивий тост з минулого дня народження. Щиро, це така дружні стосунки, це запорука успіху в реалізації абсолютних більшості проєктів, знаєте, складно інколи, як представнику адміністрації, ходити із заходу на захід, особливо, коли тематика незнайома, і починати говорити якісь розумні речі, не банальші, ну, типу, що ми радилися бачити, дякуємо, що приєдналися. Але, насправді, зростанням лабораторії міжнародної, яка була створена з усіллям Олександрі, зростають і мої знання в сфері бізнесу і прав людини. Я думаю, що на п'ятий форум я так само зможу щось виступити, принаймні, з того, що вже я почув до цього. І дійсно, хотів би пару слів сказати, що та тематика, яка була обрана, це не просто тематика в межах форуму, це, по суті, один із ключових напрямків наукових досліджень і освітніх розробок в університеті. В університеті протягом декілька років підряд успішно функціонує міжнародна лабораторія бізнесу прав людини, це інноваційний проєкт пані Олени, яка заручилася підтримкою своїх колег, перш за всім, з Данського інституту прав людини, колег-експертів ООН, колег з інших організацій, які є дружніми до нас у проведенні і цьогорічного заходу. 
Проблематика незвична, ми сприймаємо цю, цю сферу крізь призму старого явлення про трудове право і право соціальне забезпечення передовсім, але ламаються ці стереотипи і приємно відзначати, що зусилля пані Олени і команди призводять не тільки до проведення такого роду якісних заходів, а насамперед до певних зрушень в межах самої держави. Я переконаний, що найближчим часом ми все-таки вийдемо на національний план дій. Тут є відповідна підтримка. Ми просто не встигаємо проводити форум, так часто керівництво Міністерства юстиції змінюється. Да. Нам треба простіше, частіше його проводити, щоб встигнути за цими перетрубаціями. Але я сподіваюся, що все-таки національний план цього приводу буде ухвалений і те, що цьогорічні просто серія заходів, панельна дискусія вже проросла себе і вже, по суті, по суті, коли ми планували, то думали, що взагалі чи не проводити. Раніше був о, о, навколо форуму чи в межах форуму проведений захід пані Олени, а тепер форум проводиться в межах заходів. Ну, це правда, давайте говорити відверто. Тому е, завершуючи ці взаємні дифрами, хотів би сказати серйозну річ, що дійсно ми дякуємо нашим партнерам з багатьох організацій. Я думаю, пані Олена про них більш детально скаже, сам перед координатор проєкту ОБСІ України, інших колег, які щороку долучаються. Саме головне, що це вже став не просто тренд, а це такий звичний напрямок діяльності нашого університету. Я би хотів від імені адміністрації університету Раційного комітету подякувати насамперед і партнерам нашим, пані Олені, і команди за дійсно той цікавий продукт, який ви робите, і ту справу, яку ви робите. Я думаю, що вона буде оцінена як і з боку держави, так і міжнародної спільноти. І врешті ми отримаємо вже на базі Харківської міжнародної юридичної форуму щорічний Східноєвропейський форум з бізнесу та прав людини. Тож в добру путь і дякую ще раз за таку ініціативу, яка виникла абсолютно спонтанно 4 роки тому завдяки вам. Дякую дуже, пане Юрію, і ви просто да, в голос сказали ті мрії, які ми плекаємо. Дякую дуже, і дійсно наших заходів цього року могло не бути, якби у червні місяці пан Олександр на... і команда координатора проєктів ОБСЄ в Україні не сказали, що вони готові підтримати заходи з бізнесу і прав людини і, зокрема, дуже зацікавлені у розвитку тематики з бізнесу і прав людини у Східній і Центральній Європі. І, власне, починаючи з червня, так, ми стали такою однією родиною, принаймні спілкувалися один з одним точно не менше, ніж зі своїми родинами, вирішують через номенітні питання. І тому щира подяка і дійсно хочу запросити до слова пана Олександра, який представляє чудову команду, яка підтримувала весь цей час і продовжує підтримувати. Дуже дякую, колеги. Я не буду забирати багато часу. Я лише хочу сказати, що в координаторі проєктів ОБСІ України, в тій програмі, де, зокрема, я працюю, верховенство права і прав людини, ми дійсно дуже розуміємо важливість цього напрямку бізнесу і прав людини, тому що ну, ми свідомі того, що в сучасному світі великий бізнес стає потужним гравцем і особливим суб'єктом, який може відігравати дуже важливу роль в забезпеченні прав людини. Ми розуміємо, що в Україні ці ідеї ще не набули такого значного поширення, і цей форум є, напевно, основною рушійною силою спросування соціально відповідального ідеї соціально відповідального бізнесу в Україні. Я впевнений, що з такого популяризації цих ідей на форумі, з роками це перетвориться вже в нашу реальність і великий бізнес буде брати на себе все більше і більше зобов'язань в сфері забезпечення прав людини. Тому ми бажаємо вам плідної дискусії і дякуємо за те, що ви робите.
Дуже дякую. Щиро, щиро дякуємо. І, власне, з цього моменту ми починаємо вже безпосередньо нашу сьогоднішню роботу за програмою заходів. І починаємо ми з дуже важливої такої події з презентації регіональної асоціації з бізнесу і прав людини у Східній і Центральній Європі. Ця ідея народилася рік тому якраз на основі нашого спілкування в межах минулорічного Харківського міжнародного юридичного форуму, коли ми також змогли особисто зібратися з різними експертами і експертками з регіону. І після цього, продовжуючи це спілкування, дійсно вирішили, що таке об'єднання зусиль в межах асоціації, яка дозволить шукати і бути майданчиком для спілкування різних експертів, експертів, експерток, людей зі сфери науки, з бізнесу і об'єднувати, і координувати зусилля – це дійсно важливо, і це може бути таким потужним кроком для просування стандартів з бізнесу і прав людини в регіоні. І тому я з великим задоволенням хочу передати модерацію власне презентацією пані Елжбієті Карській. Це особисто Особлива людина, вона представляє, є членкиньою робочої групи ООН з бізнесу і прав людини, вона є професоркою, завідочкою кафедри захисту прав людини і міжнародного гуманітарного права, директоркою Інституту міжнародного права, права ЄС і міжнародних відносин, факультету права і управління університету кардинала Стефана Вижинського в Польщі. До того, як стати членкиньою робочої групи ООН з бізнесу і прав людини, людини. Пані Карська сім років працювала в робочій групі щодо впливу найманців на права людини, тобто вона має такий дуже багаторічний досвід відповідної роботи. І я з великим задоволенням передаю їй слово і користуючись нагодою, дякую за підтримку наших заходів і методично, змістовну з боку робочої групи ООН з бізнесу і прав людини. Це дійсно для нас дуже надзвичайно важливо, особливо на тому, в тому етапі, коли ми започатковуємо такі нові ініціативи. Будь ласка, пані Карська, вам слово. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me well. I would like to thank you, organizers, for preparing this forum, regional forum on business and human rights. It is an honor and a pleasure for me to participate in this discussion and um, I'm really grateful that uh, we can gather in such difficult conditions as we have now and we have the opportunity to address such important issues as the business and human rights uh, issue in our region. Uh, before we uh, pass to discussion, let me start from addressing a few uh, remarks on the specificity of our region and um, specificity on implementation on guiding principles in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, the countries of the Central and Eastern Europe region are facing, as in virtually all regions, um, generalized uh, challenges to ensure business respect human rights, corporate accountability and access to effective remedy for victims when harms occur. The low level of corporate respect for human rights is due to many factors, among which we can identify to the following. The concentration of state-owned enterprises in key sectors, which are not leading, by example, in respecting human rights. State control on economic, 
process and a large share of state participation in the economy contributed to a weak culture of business taking their responsibility seriously and to the absence of expectations from the state and society at large for uh, responsible business behaviors. Long period of undemocratic political regimes in many countries of the region, which led to a lack of a culture of understanding the values of human dignity and personal um, autonomy, which are core of effective human rights protection. Uh, the fall of undemocratic regimes um, allowed civil society to strengthen and develop, but um, most um, focus they work on human rights violations being perpetrated by the state and very few in the regions engage in defending human rights in the context of business activities. Human rights issues are being developed in academic work less if compared to the scale of attention they receive from Western scholars. Uh, the scientific researchers in the region are based mostly on the <clears throat> translated uh, literature and there are very few examples in which human rights and business is the subject of scientific research. I want to pay attention especially on, on that topic uh, here in this forum taking place in um, Kharkov uh, because this is the example of the high level attention to the problem which unfortunately is not in the same uh, way understood in other universities in our region. Uh, business and human rights is practically not included in high schools curriculum and even in higher education program training future lawyers, uh, including corporate lawyers, which with the consequences that may that many company managers lack knowledge of business and human rights issues. Uh, in this point, I also want to pay attention on the fact that we, in particular, uh, address this topic in general course of the protection of human rights, especially when we teach human rights in faculties of law, international relations, political science, uh, but regular courses on business and human rights issues are very rare. Uh, in, in academic programs, uh, in, in law education, political science, or business economy education. Mm. Um, I believe that scholars and practitioners, which uh, this forum brings together to discuss business and human rights issues in the regional context will greatly contribute to create the appropriate platforms to exchange views and knowledge on challenges, positive developments, and good practices between countries of the region, complementing and reinforcing the important work of other stakeholders, such as governmental bodies, business associations, civil society organizations, and human rights defenders. Ladies and gentlemen, um, this is the beginning of uh, our, our discussion. Uh, let me pass the voice to uh, our um, participants of, of this, um, this part of our discussion. And I would like to um, welcome key speakers, Ms. Beata Faracik, who is also from Poland, who is co-founder of the Association and President of Polish Institute on Human Rights and Business. Can we hear Beata? Uh, 
Okay, so we've been, uh, yes, we had a little bit of a technical hiccup at the back. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Kariska, for the very, very important words, very important introduction, and many thanks for giving the floor and the opportunity to present, um, well, some of the developments which we've, I would say, orchestrated together with um, Elena and uh, Irni Czernic. And um, let me just share my screen, perhaps, so that we can um, follow with a bit more of a case. I hope uh, the presentation is now visible. Um, so once again, uh, welcome to everybody. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at this very important regional forum. And um, the forum is the more important that it's one of those events where the idea of creating a regional network uh, stems from. Obviously, um, there were discussions in the region since uh, pretty much 2013, where the first, when the first uh, conference on business and human rights in Poland was organized, that brought also some of the stakeholders from um, other countries, but also the um, Central Eastern European conferences organized by Jernik uh, Czernic, but also Elena in Kharkov since 2017. And um, after all those events, we were kind of like, on one hand, it was like, wow, well, you know, it's such a big, body of knowledge, we should follow it more closely. And then we're kind of, well, maybe complaining a bit about the lack of um, a proper network to stay in touch, not only at those events, but on a more regular basis. And um, in the end last year, we've kind of got together with Elena and Yerne and um, co-founded what uh, we started to call Central and Eastern European scholars and professionals, business and human rights associations. So scholars and professionals are in the brackets simply because the name would be too long, so we dropped it. So now um, we started to refer to this new um, formation as um, very much, well, Zebra. <laughs> and um, so what is Zebra? It's, um, well, we, I won't obviously say that we came up with a totally new idea. Obviously, we were inspired to a large extent by the Global Business uh, and Human Rights Scholars Association. We were given very good example by our Latin American colleagues who created a regional um, network, regional association. And we kind of followed suit seeing that it actually worked, that it really helps to connect um, people. And so we've created what we call Central and Eastern European Business and Human Rights Association, uh, CIPRA, <laughs> as it seems. It seems that we should have a specific animal in our logo. And uh, it is a regional association of academics, business and civil society professionals and policymakers um, who are united to basically promote research, awareness raising, capacity building and teaching of human rights and business in business contexts in broadly understood Central and Eastern Europe. And I'll get to what we mean by the broadly understood Central and Eastern Europe um, in a moment. For the time being, you will find also some very basic information about the association on the website, which you can see at the bottom of the slide. And um, when talking about um, kind of the scope and what we want to do, I will kind of focus on more formal issues and Jirna Czernic will uh, tell a bit more about what are our plans, what we want to do. But I think it's important to stress that we see it, first of all, as a network of people who stay connected together, not only at the events, but in between. So we see it as an opportunity to exchange views, exchange information about some of the most current research as it happens. And um, association is meant to cover all countries belonging to Eastern Europe as understood by the UN. Um, because we kind of feel more attached, I guess, to the notion of Central Europe also when it comes to Poland and several countries in this region, but also um, colleagues a bit more from the South, hence why in the name of the association focus kind of on more Central, is this Central and Eastern Europe, while 
um, in reality, it will follow um, kind of the membership, uh, which overlaps with that of the UN. Um, in terms of the memberships, it will be individual membership. It's not institutional. We acknowledge the fact that people are changing jobs and that the situation can differ. So, you know, a membership, like in case of the Global Business and Human Rights Association and the, the original one in Latin America will be individual one. And we will make a difference between scholars and professionals. So people who can actually prove, show evidence of expertise in business and human rights and students. So those who want to learn, who want to stay in touch, who would like to learn. And um, obviously with time, we plan on developing a newsletter where also other people could kind of stay abreast of the developments. Um, the only condition to join the membership is to come from one of those countries and provide evidence that one actually has expertise, be it through a series of articles or through the work on business and human rights in practice. I mean, what is very specific, well, I'm not sure whether it's specific only for our region, but uh, certainly the fact is that a number of people working on business and human rights are not necessarily attached to the university, hence why we find it important that we also capture expertise of those people who are working for the civil society or uh, in business. And um, joining is easy, it's enough to send us a letter, we'll send a registration form back. Um, as mentioned, I guess I'm coming slowly to the end of my time, so uh, to leave enough space uh, for your name to talk, I'll just kind of hint that obviously we are planning organizing different events and activities, so it's a special issue of Business and Human Rights Journal focused on Central and Eastern Europe um, region forthcoming. Um, but obviously it all, um, yeah, you're able to talk about it in much more detail in a moment. And um, as mentioned at the beginning, you'll find this very basic info also at our temporary web page. And we hope with time to develop a more comprehensive one where we can also place uh, more of our research also to create a sort of database of research on Central Eastern Europe region. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bata. It was a pleasure to listen to your presentation. Uh, and this is a perfect um, response to, to the need um, of uh, the need in, in our region. Um, thank you once again. Thank you very much once again. And now I would like to give the floor to Dr. Uh, Jereni Letner Cernic, who is co-founder of the association and who works at the Faculty of Government and European Studies in Slovenia, uh, Nova uh, University. Good morning, good afternoon. Uh... Thank you very much, Elisabetta, for uh, introducing me and sharing this panel. Uh, uh, most of all, uh, thank you very much, Olena, for organizing uh, this uh, fantastic forum on uh, business and human rights in Central and Eastern Europe. Unfortunately, we are, most of us, uh, online, but none, uh, nevertheless, it's good to see uh, all the friends and uh, colleagues, colleagues who are working in this field not only Central Eastern Europe, but also uh, globally. Now, uh, Beata already mentioned that the idea behind the creation of uh, association of uh, business human rights scholars from Central Eastern Europe uh, goes uh, back to the, to the fact that we want to promote and also enhance the understanding of uh, business human rights issues uh, in our region and also to, to strengthen uh, both institutions and individuals uh, from uh, negative impacts that business may have in, in uh, our, our region. Uh, you all know that, uh, that Central Eastern Europe is uh, the region which is not known for uh, uh, model human rights protection uh, and has many systematic and general problems uh, in ensuring uh, 
human rights and fundamental freedoms to, to its populations and to ensuring uh, rule of law uh, in, a, in national context. And often we also see that um, there are many challenges concerning, uh, concerning uh, Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, okay, because I saw just... Beautiful uh, view of your country. It's in yeah, the yeah. Okay, so, so the many challenges concerning business and human rights in Central Eastern uh, Europe, uh, concerning rule of law, and many, many times also businesses uh, are uh, connected with uh, the governments in attempting to undermine human rights protection standards uh, and so on. So the, the main point of... Uh, our association is in the first place to, to gather scholars you know, who work in this field in, in our region in order to, 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 to build a strong, strong uh, basis, which could then work on promoting uh, business human rights standards in our region. And, and we, we plan to do this, or we are already doing this in, uh, in, the, in, the, following, uh, in the following areas. Uh, by organizing the forum, which Olana uh, has been organizing just now and we also plan in the future in the next year to hold uh, a series of workshops on business human rights uh, in Central Eastern Europe. Then we have also an idea to to promote this area among the younger generation and uh, to organize a summer course on business human rights following examples from uh, uh, other regions uh, and other environments uh, and as, as Abad already mentions, uh, mentioned, uh, our plan is also to, to, to issue a call for papers uh, on the business human rights uh, in Central Eastern Europe of the Business Human Rights uh, Journal, uh, which is published by uh, Cambridge University Press. And this will come out uh, probably in the next months and uh, we'll, build, we'll build momentum to, to this uh, call for papers uh, through a series of blog posts, which will be published on the on the on the blog of uh, Business Human Rights uh, Journal of, um, of uh, Cambridge University Press. So there are many many activities we, we want to uh, work on, but primarily the the main objectives of our station is to to promote business uh, and human rights in the region and also to to uh, enhance the standards, no? uh, because the standards which may, which may be obvious, uh, perhaps in more in more developed regions of the world, uh, as far of course business human rights is concerned, are, are not so obvious. Uh, are not so obvious in our regions. Just just to mention briefly, I'll, and I'll talk a bit more on that uh, in the next session. Just to mention the standards on due diligence. Uh, not many companies which are based. Central Eastern Europe uh, are familiar with these uh, obligations uh, which companies have to have to do. Uh, or also, we want to we want to focus on the issue of rule of law in business human rights in Central Eastern uh, Europe. Often, often uh, daily politics, particularly in post-Soviet countries, is uh, is uh, mixed with. Uh, Major, uh, major business uh, interest, not to mention you know, the, the very super notorious cases from European Court of Human Rights concerning that, uh, just, just remember the case concerning UCOS and nationalization of UCOS in Russian Federation. So there are many issues uh, uh, we plan to, uh, to work on and we hope that many of you will, will join our association and try to contribute in, uh, in your national environments to promote association and to organize, organize events. As you know, um, Central and Eastern Europe is not as harmonious regions as other regions uh, which, are, which are a part of the United Nations. No? There are many different national contexts, many uh, cultural differences, uh, uh, notwithstanding uh, language barriers, so there are, it's often very, talk, very difficult to talk about common problems. Uh, so, it, so it's really good also that many of you from different countries, from all, from all 23, 24 countries of Central and Eastern Europe would join our association, try to, to promote it and work on these issues 
uh, in in your national context. So for for uh, for this point, uh, I'll stop here and maybe I can jump in a bit later as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Yerni. Uh, you brought very important uh, issues on the specificity of our region, including uh, a new generation, younger generation, who we should um, incorporate to, to our discussion, I think. And of course, university is the, the best place uh, to, um, to do that. Um, I would like to pass the floor to Ms. Tara Van Hu, who is a co-president of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association, also lecturer in the School of Law and Human Rights Center um, at the University of Essex, Great Britain. So Tara, the floor is yours. Can we hear Tara? Uh, unfortunately, um, at this moment, we have not Tara with us, and that's why uh, we um, can, yeah, we can hear now Michael Santora, who is founder of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association, and hope that Tara will join us uh, soon. Okay. Welcome, Michael. Professor Biata Faricic and Professor Jernish Chernich. Professor Uvarova asked me in these opening remarks if I might say something about how legal scholars and scholars from other disciplines, my own being business ethics, might differ in the contributions they could make to the BHR field. Perhaps the best way to understand the differences is the reaction to the promulgation a decade ago of the United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. When the guiding principles came out, lawyers were quick to shout, guiding, that is too weak a word. How can we turn these principles into law? Perhaps the most extreme example of this professional orientation is the chaotic quest for a binding global treaty on business and human rights. By contrast, when business ethicists like me saw the guiding principles, we shouted, principles? What principles are these? Do they really accurately describe the true corporate social responsibility for human rights? What makes them morally binding apart from their mere assertion by the United Nations? This difference in approach underscores the complex relationship between law and ethics. Law, for the most part, incorporates our shared understanding about what is morally right and wrong. Contract law, for example, exists because we think it is morally right to keep promises. Tort law exists because we think it is morally wrong to injure someone. At the same time, sometimes there is no moral consensus, and so the law is unsteady at best. In the United States, for example, the legal rights of the LGBTQI community are far from secure as a result of a lack of moral consensus. More importantly, however, the distinction between law and ethics is important to uphold because the law is sometimes unjust and needs to be changed. For example, the apartheid laws of South Africa, the Nuremberg laws in Germany, and in my own country, the United States, the scourge of slavery and the continuing systemic racism against citizens of African ancestry. In the business and human rights field, lawyers and, and ethicists need to work together. The ethicists must remain focused on the moral content of human rights because in part, there are many areas of human rights where the guiding principles offer neither guidance nor principles. What are the responsibilities of businesses operating in China for the massive tragedy of Uyghur oppression? What responsibilities do drug companies have to make COVID vaccines affordable in the global South? The guiding principles offer scant insight into these questions. At the same time, lawyers have a crucial role 
in the pursuit of justice. Only they understand how legislatures, judiciaries, and government executives work to make a moral idea a reality that can be relied upon by ordinary citizens. In sum, I want to conclude by saying that human rights are moral rights, but if they are to have meaning and impact, they must be turned into legal rights. Lawyers and non-lawyers each have a unique role to play in the BHR community. Thus, let us all join together in saying about the guiding principles, guiding principles, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I wish you a stimulating and, conge and, and collegial conference. Thank you very much for this video presentation. I hope we will have the chance to exchange our comments on um, lawyers and not lawyers oh, yeah. of, um, of this issue. So I can see Tara. Tara is with us. So welcome once again, Tara. I don't have to introduce you uh, once again, I think. Uh, welcome and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Astriana. Um, On behalf of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association, I want to say how exciting it is to see this year's conference come together. Again, um, I know that you've been doing this for a while in Kharkiv, and it's such a pleasure to know that our Eastern European scholars are having an opportunity to meet and to um, collaborate together so that we understand better the perspectives that are coming from Eastern Europe. I'm grateful to the conference organizers. Our community is always better when we can hear from people of diverse opinions, diverse experiences, and, um, uh, and uh, better, sorry, <laughs> diverse experiences and diverse opinions and diverse scholarship. Uh, we hope that in the future that this group, that, that you will um, be joined by African and Asian regional groups as you have by the Latin American group. By the Latin American group. Uh, Michael has just talked about the importance of our field in light of coronavirus, COVID-19. I won't add much, but the pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of the global community and our supply chains. It has also exposed how a pandemic can become a political tool and what that means for the most vulnerable workers. It is not the case, as was often said at the beginning, that COVID is a, is a pandemic that's experienced by everyone equally. In fact, we have seen very clearly that there are ruptures within our society. And it is imperative that our field take the lead in helping to construct a better global economy and a better global approach to the issue of business and human rights than what we have seen so far. We know that the burden of the disease is hitting hardest those people who are already in precarious positions before. And I'm looking to the Eastern European group, along with our, our colleagues in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, to take the lead in responding here. The reality is, is that what is broken about our system was broken by those of us who, uh, and I say this with all humility, live in the Western Europe and, and other group. We, we've created constraints within our society, within our global economy that are problematic. And I don't think that the solutions to those are going to come from the very people or the very places that created the current problems. So I really hope that this group together, that the colleagues within Eastern Europe, that the community that you are starting will have the opportunity to push forward and come up with some creative solutions and some great insights that will move the field and our society to a better place. Thank you again for having me. And uh, I hope this is a productive few days for you. Thank you very much, uh, Tara. So I'm happy we have a representation from different regions. This is the place and opportunity to learn uh, each other, one another, um, how to deal with problems uh, of business and human rights, especially. In, in academic um, programs. Uh, now I would like to move according to the agenda 
to Ms. Umberto Cantu Rivera, uh, Latin American Regional Association on Business and Human Rights Scholars, who is professor in the School of Law, Uni University of Monterrey, uh, Mexico. Um, can we ensure that we have uh, Umberto with us? Uh, we have a video from Umberto because of time difference, uh, but then uh, um, Daniela Pamplona, who is the vice uh, chair of the Latin America Regional Association, will join us and uh, we will have opportunity to ask her about the experience of Latin America Re Regional Association work. I'm very grateful to Olena Ovarova for her invitation uh, uh, to join this important event this regional event, even though I cannot be uh, presently with you, even in a virtual format because of the time difference. So what I would like to do in the next uh, few minutes is to share a few of uh, my remarks on the uh, reason why we decided to found this uh, Latin American Scholars Association and some of the challenges and achievements that we have had in the past uh, two or three years. To, be, to begin with, why did we decide to uh, set up this uh, initiative? The very first reason is that when I met Daniela Pamplona in 2017 in the Santa Clara Conference of the Scholars Association, we knew that we needed to do something on a regional scale. We didn't know what, but I was coming of the successful publication of the very first book in Spanish on business and human rights with a regional perspective that was published in 2017. So we already had a basis of scholars working in Latin America, Latin Americans basically, who were uh, addressing the different dimensions of this topic. So uh, we decided to start this project uh, in early uh, 2018, I believe. And uh, the very first step that we took was to set up a board of members who would uh, be uh, in charge of uh, discussing and overseeing the activities of the association. So we started with a board of 11 people, we later expanded it to 15 people uh, with different backgrounds, although many of them being lawyers or, or uh, legal scholars, uh, many of them also being scholars and practitioners, which is of course an advantage, and uh, with uh, different nationalities represented. That was the very first step and part of the reason why we decided to found this uh, regional uh, association. Now, in terms of challenges and achievements, and I don't want to be uh, too long on this, but uh, the main challenges that we found have been, uh, to begin with, the possibility of devoting extra time to this project. Of course, it is uh, very clear that for many of us scholars or scholars practitioners, uh, our agenda is not necessarily simple, so I would call that as the very first challenge that we have found, how to devote enough time, efforts, and strength actually to uh, make the association work. The second challenge I would uh, present here is the fact that there are different voices, different opinions, and it is important to ensure that all of them are welcome. That is not necessarily easy, especially uh, among the different members of the association, but nevertheless, uh, that is one of the key elements that I believe are necessary to make any of uh, any project like this work. So openness to different positions, different ideas, especially on a topic as, as controversial as this one. Um, but beyond that, uh, we have been very lucky to have a very uh, interesting group effort, a very interesting collective effort that has allowed us to actually uh, move forward in the development of several projects. And this is where I would like to spend the next minute speaking of. Um, in terms of our achievements, uh, we have just concluded our second Latin American Conference on Human Rights and Business. Uh, over the two uh, different conferences that we have last year in Bogota and this year uh, hosted by the University of Monterrey, although held online, we have had over a hundred presenters 
uh, in uh, both conferences. So that is already uh, a, an achievement in itself. And uh, from what I heard from one of my colleagues who is not a scholar, she's a practitioner, but who has been present in both conferences, uh, her, her remarks were that um, it has started to become a fixed conference that everyone expects to uh, one year in advance. So that is already, I would say, an achievement. Number two, uh, we have developed a few projects, research projects that have been uh, thought in a regional uh, uh, focus, I would say, uh, addressing the topic of uh, reparations or access to remedy in Latin America. What does it mean in practice to have this? There is another ongoing project on national contact points in the region, so also focus on access to remedy, but not just on that. And largely, uh, I believe we have already several uh, scholarly projects, uh, two or three, uh, two or three books that are being um, produced as we speak on the specific characteristics of Latin America, especially now that we are close to reaching the 10 year milestone of the adoption of the UN guiding principles. And another one of which I'm sure Daniele will, will speak about later and Carolina on uh, women and business and human rights. Now, um, what I would invite the uh, Eastern European uh, Association to engage with is how do we bring these standards, these international standards to the local realities? Because again, as, and as I've mentioned in several parts, um, it is not the same to think of all of these standards from a, a Danish or Northern European setting or just in general uh, Western European setting than to think of it in terms of the political and legal reality complexities and specific identity of the different world regions. So my basic suggestion, and this is where I would like to close my, my short remarks, uh, would be to actually focus on how do we translate this to our local realities, to our local needs, and how do we ensure that businesses and governments play their role when addressing human rights issues. Thank you very much again, and I hope uh, that you will have a very pleasant conference and uh, the best of luck to you in this new effort to uh, start a new regional association on business and human rights. Take care. Thank you, Umberto, for this video uh, and Thank you for sharing with us specificity of Latin American uh, region on, on um, business and human rights uh, issues, especially in the area of uh, academic uh, experience. Um, I understand the uh, time difference um, for Daniel is, uh, I hope, less problematic. And uh, if we have Daniel with us, I would like to pass the floor to, to Danielle. Is she with us? Yes, I'm here. Okay, Danielle, the floor Thank is you. yours. Thank you, it's better. Um, it's almost seven o'clock in the morning here. So yes, I've been awake for a while. I would like to start by thanking also, and especially Professor Olena Uvarova for the invitation to be here today at this regional forum. It's a pleasure to share this panel with my colleagues. I think the contribution I can give in this panel is to add a bit on top of what Umberto has already said and share a little of the concerns we had when we created the Latin American branch of the Global Association. While academic discussion around what we can call today the business and human rights field was consolidating around this group of people who has created the Global Association. I had the great pleasure to be part of a meeting in Seattle at the University of Washington, hosted by the Global uh, Association's co-president and chair of the UN Working Group, Anita Ramzastri, and I could testify the commitment of that group around the need that the business and human rights ag agenda could move forward in the academic realm. It is part of the association genesis, the recognition of the relevant role that academy has in setting agendas, in establishing contents, collaborating to find solution 
um, amid so many disputed contexts and interpretation. Umberto and I felt completely welcome to the extent that we could openly exchange ideas about particular needs of our region. So Latin American countries, as I am sure happens in Central and Eastern European countries, counts with mature academics with a history of researches and discussions in different issues related to business and human rights. But I felt that many did not recognize themselves, and maybe some still don't, as knowledge producers of this specific field. So one of the first challenges of our branch was to present itself as a catalyzer for these people, to make them feel like pertaining to a group and recognizing in their peers people with the same academic interest. And the response we got, as Umberto was saying, was immediate, strong, and very positive. We established the annual conference that was first held in Bogota, and this year we just held the second conference virtually as an achievement that Umberto has already mentioned to us. Still, there is uh, another challenge to overcome. We are academics researching, thinking, and producing knowledge about what is happening in our backyard. And there is so much going, in, going on in our backyard related to human rights abuses and violations. So the branch gives a chance for our voices to be heard since I believe those people are the ones who should have a say, not only to describe what is happening there or here, but also a say on what would be the best prevention and reparation measures. Another important thing to bear in mind is that the business and human rights field is in full throttle nowadays, and that requires many eyes and hands to be careful around the many issues that are being discussed. Walking through differences among uh, corporate social responsibility, responsible business conduct and business and human rights, or discussions on the need for compulsory uh, due diligence on human rights, or the role and protection of human rights defenders in our region, especially now with the Escazu agreement. But mostly remedies and effectiveness are only some of the pressing issues for the region. In this regard, we have opened a call to a special issue about Latin America um, at the Business and Human Rights Journal, which we expect to be out next year, being another venue to make Latin American academics be heard or read in this case. I am confident that the branch is giving all these academics a space for networking and blooming, and my hopes are that they see the branch as a venue to raise the level of dialogue and the incidents of the researchers in the real world. While I hope not only our branch, but also your Central and East European Business and Human Rights Center might fill the space. Our co-presidents, Tara and Anita, and even before them, the co-founder, Michael Centrolo, and actually the whole board, they have been very supportive of the idea and are truly fostering strength building in the region. I wish you all the best and we're looking forward for engaging with you and for further discussions to find where are the similarities and the difference of the hurdles that our regions face and together help building solutions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you for joining us uh, despite the difference uh, of time. Uh, it is very, very early um, for, for you. Uh, specificity of this big country is uh, very important for, for us, especially to, uh, in order to compare, uh, um, to compare experiences and uh, to find out, um, I would say, guiding, um, guiding um, principles also for, for our region and its uh, specificity. So uh, a lot of interesting um, questions, topics uh, were raised uh, in, in this uh, part of our um, conference. Uh, so uh, now I would like to 
give the floor uh, again uh, according to the um, um, name that that you um, according to the order that you you are taking the floor if you have any comments any um, advices uh, but especially comments and questions um, on what was said um, until now uh, I hope we can we can share and um, focus on it for the last um, 15 minutes before before the break so uh, can we pass uh, first to Beata thank you very much and um, thank you for very interesting and for very important statements and contributions. I was trying to allude to it at the beginning, but um, to be fair, I think one of the final decisions to actually establish um, the association and kind of think about it also as part of the bigger network, as part, let's say kind of like a, as if local chapter of the global association was exactly the very, um, very positive and very engaging way um, um, that we met um, even like last year in Essex during the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association Conference where both Tara and Anita and Michael were very, very outcome, forthcoming and very welcoming and offered all help to help us establish and build the network in the region and kind of really extended their very sincere, um, I would say, um, kind of approach to helping us also turn the attention of other scholars to the developments in the region. And the experience also that Daniela and uh, Humberto shared back then in, in Essex as well on how they've approached some of the difficulties in setting up, um, what, what were the challenges that they faced in the region. It was also something very, very important for us to think through when we were thinking about, okay, so what challenges do we face? Are they similar or shall we look into something else? And some of the issues that um, Yerne raised, that was exact, those were exactly those, some of the concerns and reflections about the specifics of the region that we need to have in mind when we kind of think about developing um, either training sessions or conferences, but also the more important it is to have, I think, um, such network. Uh, because right now we are kind of, well, we've got some, let's say, some small uh, groupings around, uh, let's say, more in Southern Europe or around um, Harkip Forum in kind of um, Central Eastern Europe, but we still kind of don't engage enough, I think, with colleagues from countries like Armenia, Azerbaijan, or uh, Moldova. And I think, I really hope that this network will help us to reach out and really connect all those scattered individuals and help to strengthen um, the capacity of all of us and our awareness. And um, as Tara said, perhaps it will help us to kind of respond to some of the challenges which in our region are perhaps more, um, I would say, visible. I mean, some of the issues that we are facing in our economies are perhaps not, um, kind of specifically existing only here, but here they are kind of the most visible, for example, the percentage of the informal economies, uh, kind of the percentage of people that are employed on civil law contracts instead of employment contracts. Uh, the increase, the huge increase in um, outsourcing, which basically is almost, I mean, you're almost doing something which you could call like body leasing because you are kind of renting people to another company by a company which doesn't even employ them, but has a civil law contract with them. So there are a number of operations that um, we need to tackle, which kind of more mature democracies kind of managed to kind of tackle simply because they're reacting very quickly with the legislative order. Like even if we look to platform economies, like, which in Germany was very quickly targeted because it kind of, it was, just basically almost defined as if not an innovative way of doing business, but an innovative way of trying to go around the regulations and, and uh, tax law and also regulations concerning um, uh, the requirements of the taxi drivers. And we don't have this reaction either in Poland and I think also in, in other countries. I mean, 
the so so yeah, I think we, we need to raise up to the challenge as academics, as civil society activists, as some of the business professionals that actually do influence the decision making in their companies. So um, yes, I, I just can hope that uh, with time we'll rise to this challenge because it's not an easy task and those are issues that a number of people have thought about so far. But I think start, we need to start thinking also in terms of finding solutions. And for that, we need to really map and to know what we are talking about. And hence, it's a very crucial role of academics to help us um, also get this ground covered to know what we talk about, to get this status quo picture. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bata. Uh, and thank you in particular for raising the topic of the visibility of, of the region. So when I joined a United Nations Working Group on Business and Human Rights, my key, um, the key point for, for me was to, um, to do something with the visibility, to bring this region to global uh, visibility. So visibility of the region uh, is very important and um, much um, work um, still is waiting to, to be done uh, in order to uh, discuss specificity and, and uh, work uh, on the specificity. Uh, so um, visibility of, of the region uh, also became uh, a part of um, forum, UN forum on business and human rights and in this uh, place, in this conference, I would like to uh, thank you, uh, Beata and um, Yerni, who, um, uh, of course, um, uh, Olena, who participated in in the session, regional session um, devoted to uh, um, Eastern, uh, Central, and Eastern Europe in in Geneva. Um, we hope this uh, discussion on um, regional uh, specific uh, sessions uh, will be um, uh, also this year will be taking place in this year. I also try to focus on interregional uh, sessions on uh, business and human rights uh, experiences, especially what we can exchange um, um, between between uh, regions in the uh, United Nations. Um, thank you, uh, Beata, and uh, I would like to ask for um, last uh, comments, uh, Yerni, if you can uh, share with you your uh, questions, your comments on what was uh, said, what was discussed uh, in this first panel. Thank you very much, uh, Elisabetta. I would also <coughs> give back the thanks also to you for uh, bringing uh, attention uh, to this uh, region of Central Eastern Europe by organizing the special session last year on, uh, on this issue, on this, this region. I think slowly, slowly attention is growing also to this, to this region. Uh, I often, you know, I, I often hear uh, many comments from my uh, Colleagues from other parts of Europe, uh, why do we need why do we need uh, to divide the uh, discussion of business human rights uh, in Europe on uh, on Central Eastern Europe and and uh, if you want nor Northern uh, Western Southern South Southern uh, Europe? But my answer has always been that, uh, notwithstanding the, the you know notwithstanding the division of, within the United Nations on these regions, which stems as you know from the Cold War. Notwithstanding that, but uh, my answer has always been that this region uh, merits uh, special attention, special attention, given uh, given not only the common common history. You know, all of the countries from the region were behind Iron, Iron Curtain until 1989, 90, 1990, uh, but also common problems uh, in business human rights, which uh, we often see. You know. Uh, Bata already, already mentions the lack of knowledge uh, concerning this field, then rule of law problems, general human rights 
protection problems in our region, which are seen from uh, uh, really uh, crazy numbers of applications which people uh, send to the European Court of Human European uh, European Court of Human Rights. Uh, so there are general systematic problems in our regions, generally in human rights, but also in business in business in uh, human rights, which which one cannot really see in other parts of Europe. Uh, and uh, in my opinion, that merits that merits. Uh, Special attention on this region, special, special, uh, you know, associations, association which we established with Beat and uh, uh, Orlena, because the issues are common and they are they're quite different than than uh, many of our, our friends and colleagues uh, in Western, Northern, uh, and Southern Europe uh, experience daily when they work in business, in business uh, and human rights. Here, I can also second what Umberto said. Uh, I agree with him that uh, it's very important how to translate how to translate these uh, standards to the to the to the ground, no? to the uh, to the business activities, business operations, daily lives of uh, of, of persons. We, you know, we are often often uh, uh, the most uh, the most pertinent problems from uh, Central Eastern Europe concerning business human rights even uh, don't make the news you know, uh, at the global uh, news uh, outlets, you know, cases such as you know, um, violations of uh, miners' workers' rights, both in the uh, Russian Federation and other parts of post-Soviet uh, Soviet Union, rural law problems, you know, connections between the politics and uh, and business in many parts of uh, Central and uh, Eastern uh, Eastern Europe, and those are problems which are very common to to, to our region. And, but of course, challenges 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 are there because the governments are not very keen to address the issue. You know, let let's be let's be honest. Only only a handful of, only a handful of countries have um, drafted national action uh, uh, plans. You know, only Poland, Czech Republic. Uh, Slovenia and Lithuania, they have a specific business and human rights national action plan to implement UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Georgia has a special chapter within the general national human rights um, action, uh, action, uh, action plan. Uh, but other countries, no, particularly uh, those countries from Eastern Europe, which were part of former Soviet Union, they are uh, lagging behind and much has to be done uh, you know, to, to promote uh, this issue, you know, to, to, you know, to translate first the formal standards and then also to translate formal standards into daily practice, to, uh, to work in, working some institutions and to ensure that human dignity of individuals um, is protected against the corporate uh, activities uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our region. So, this discussion, this forum, this forum is uh, uh, right uh, in place and time uh, that we that we address this uh, these issues. And uh, as ma as many of us uh, are aware, uh, there is a lack of research. There is lack of uh, rigorous and very detailed, diligent research on business human rights in Central and Eastern Europe. Often, all we see that in our region, business human rights is uh, you know, uh, it's confused with uh, corporate social responsibility, which is a more, more voluntary approach uh, to, to social issues of businesses. So it's, it's very important that uh, first uh, business human rights association uh, maps what has been done already in this field and try to connect people who are working uh, uh, in, this, um, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Yedni. Thank you for also raising the problem of national action plans. And we have to focus on it, I think, in Eastern, um, Eastern Europe countries. Uh, so uh, last year, um, report to General Assembly, report of the working group um, on business and human rights was about uh, national action plans and we 
uh, incorporated many recommendations um, how to develop national action plans, especially in, in these regions. I think uh, uh, the, the use of these uh, recommendations is important to, uh, to use in practice, of course. Uh, we are uh, almost in the um, time of break. I just wanted to be equal for all uh, participants. So one or two minutes also uh, for, for Tara and Daniel, if you could take the floor, uh, Tara, in order to have equal time for all participants. Thank you, that's very kind. Um, I actually, have to say how inspired I was to hear the various issues that Beata, Yerne, and, and Elspieta that you've already identified in terms of what needs to be brought to the fore of our thinking on business and human rights. Um, if I can admit to my own ignorance on some of these issues, um, I thought that I had a decent understanding of what was going on in Eastern Europe and within those speeches I've already learned so much about areas that we should be thinking about. Um, and areas in which hopefully the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association can support researchers within Eastern and Southern Europe to, to really um, push the agenda forward on these issues. It's always important, I think, for us to keep in mind the need for national action plans in these areas, as, as Yerne and, and as we have that you have both said. Um, but I also want us to be cautious of overselling national action plans um, so far. And, and if we talk about where they've been produced uh, quite frequently, it's, it's in Western Europe. Um, and they haven't lived up to the potential that they could. And it would be really interesting to see um, national action plans be picked up within Eastern Europe, but with real commitments, real promises to reform. There's an assumption within, I think, a lot of Western European states, um, as well as the other members of the Western Europe and other groups, so Australia, Canada, United States, Israel, New Zealand, I think that's everyone, mm -hmm. um, that, that they really, um, there's this expectation that they've figured it out, that they know what business and human rights is supposed to look like, and they know how we should be addressing the issues that we that have plagued the field for 40 years. And the reality is those national action plans aren't particularly impressive. Um, they don't tackle some of the fundamental problems that we have within the field. And they don't actually address some of the structural issues that have given rise to, to significant socioeconomic inequality within the region. Um, I don't, when I said before that I don't think that the answers are going to come from Western Europe, I was sincere in that because that's the kind of national action plan that we're producing. And my hope is that Eastern Europe would show us a better, a better venue forward, a better way forward. Beata, I see you shaking your head. I know that that's, I know I'm being optimistic. I know I'm being idealistic. Well, maybe the second action, national action plan of Poland will be better than the first one, but the first wasn't very impressive. <laughs> Let me say, I also, I also think that it's not really my role to tell you that they're not good so far, but I think that it is important for us to think and, and for scholars within the region to take the lead on this and to start developing what national action plans within Eastern Europe should look like and Southern Europe should look like. And I think when scholars take that role, when we take the lead, we actually come up with a lot better solutions than, than those in the political and economic leadership have. And I think it'd be really interesting to see the, the network that's emerging in Eastern Europe and, and Southern Europe, what your, what your regional group does in terms of comparing and contrasting, putting out real proposals for what needs to change. Because once we have those foundational proposals, once you've done the, the scholastic work, it's much easier to push the states to include those in the national action plans. In my experience, what they're looking for is a little bit of um, what my students sometimes want to do with their exams. They want to just copy and paste it from one, from one document to the next. And if we can create those documents, those foundational platforms um, within the Scholars Association, we can, we can roll that out, I think, much more effectively. And so um, 
I'm when I said that I'm looking to Eastern Europe, I didn't actually mean I'm looking to the state or to the economic actors. I'm looking to you as scholars, as creative thinkers, as people who understand much better than we do what the actual challenges are on the ground in Eastern Europe and Southern Europe and, and the ability, what you think is realistic in light of the cultural realities to change and how you can push forward. And so I have a great deal of faith in all of you, much more than I have faith in anyone else in the world on these issues. I mean, I have more faith in scholars on these issues than I do in, in the economic and political powers. Uh, to make the changes that we need and to put forward a platform for something different. And so that's what I'm excited for. And that's what I'm looking forward to from you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, Tara. So uh, I can promise in case of Poland that Beata and me will do our best to convince uh, our government to amendments to improve the national action plans in, in various various aspects. So I would like to add uh, much, but we are exceeding time. And I wanted to give at least one minute to Daniel. Daniel, if you have any comments, and then I will pass the voice to, to Olena. But we will meet also tomorrow uh, in the morning. So I hope we will uh, uh, focus on uh, some other interesting uh, aspects of our discussion that we only touched uh, uh, this morning, this afternoon. Daniel? Thank you. I'll just like to mention, this is, this is the kind of support that we get from the Global Association. So this is exactly what Tara has been doing to us all the time. Thanks, Tara. And also, I'll just like to mention that from, well, our region has so many different uh, countries and so many countries, and of course, NAPs are not really popular here. Well, in my country, we have dropped the, the whole idea of an app for a while now but what i wanted to focus from what i've heard is just that we do have we do have to share and discuss because actually we do share many of the hurdles so i hear corporate capture i hear the fact that we both have so many authoritarian regimes who have been who have been just more or less discreetly narrowed the venues for democratic participation we are dangerous countries here. We have dangerous countries, very dangerous countries for human rights defenders. This is a hurdle. How can we talk about reasons and human rights if our human rights defenders cannot raise their voices? And of course, extractivism is still the hugest um, economic venue to, um, for the human rights abuses to happen in our region. But we do also have a very important regional system for protection of human rights, the Inter-American system, who has been also improving the way that they see business um, relating to human rights abuses. And we're actually building standards that we could actually share and maybe we'll give ideas on what else academics could do to try to raise the bar. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Daniel. And thank you all participants and organizers for this opportunity to raise those challenges uh, or issues uh, on business and human rights. I um, realize we weren't able to uh, answer all questions uh, here in, in this first session. But uh, once again, thank you very much to Kharkov University for gathering uh, us. And um, I want to give back the, the uh, voice to Alana. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to, all, uh, to all panelists uh, and uh, to Elzbieta Takarska. Thank you very much. It was uh, um, extremely important for, for us uh, to have a um, member of uh, UN um, Working Group on Business and Human Rights to moderate this session, which is um, extremely important for us. And uh, I would like to say to all panelists today that uh, it was a great chance 
it's uh, for me great opportunity for me to bring together all people which uh, um, um, inspiring for me uh, people absolutely to make uh, um, next uh, effort to make next steps to develop uh, UN guiding principles implementation uh, in uh, Ukraine and in the region uh, in whole. Thank you very much and uh, we will continue our work uh, today and uh, we will start uh, at uh, um, actually at just a few minutes we have uh, uh, for break and we will start uh, five minutes later with academic uh, round table uh, and we will have um, uh, presentations from Yerne Chernich, from Beata Faracic, uh, uh, from Yekaterina Dekala from Belarus, uh, from our colleague uh, from Lithuania, uh, and uh, from Yulia Razmitaeva, who is uh, my great, excellent colleague from my university. Uh, so we are going to have very fruitful discussion. Thank you uh, to all participants of this event and uh, we are going um, looking forward to to, um, to welcome you during our next event thank you again and uh, be in touch <laughs>
оно люди не Шановні учасники, спочатку скажу українською, ми починаємо. Ті, ті з учасників, хто слідкує за нами в зумі і хто раптом ще не має можливості переключити переклад, будь ласка, подивіться в чат, там є посилання, як завантажити, це займе одну хвилину, нову версію зуму і ви будете чути переклад, зможете перемикатися між каналами. Діа Патісапенс, who are following us in the Zoom, please, if you have not technical opportunity at this moment to hear us in English, please uh, upload the new version of the Zoom. You have the link in the chat and you will have opportunity to hear us uh, in English as well. Наші робочі мови на наступні три години роботи це англійська і українська, і ми починаємо науковий круглий стіл з бізнесу і прав людини, і ідея цього круглого столу – презентувати цікаві наукові напрацювання з бізнесу і прав людини від тих науковців, які представляють власний регіон. Це не, не обов'язково напрацювання, які мають своїм предметом дослідження саме проблематику Центральної і Східної Європи, але ми, власне, хочемо представити голоси Центральної і Східної Європи. Це дійсно дуже цікаві дослідження і дуже серйозні дослідники і дослідниці працюють в регіоні, хоча, звичайно, що їх небагато на сьогодні і тим ще більш ціннішими їх наукові напрацювання. І для початку нашого наукового круглого столу я із задоволенням хочу надати слово пану Олександру Петришину, який очолює Національну академію правових наук України, є завідувачем кафедри теорії та історії права Національного юридичного університету України. Ця людина, яку я знаю вже 20 років, пан Олександр мене знає менше, але я його, звичайно, знаю зі свого першого курсу 20 років і, звичайно, пишаюся тим, що можу бути його колегою, працювати на його кафедрі і відчинити 
відчувати наукову підтримку в тих ініціативах, які ми започатковуємо. Пане Олександре, вам слово. Дякую. Шановні наші зарубіжні учасники «Круглий столу», шановні колеги, дорогі друзі, перш за все я хочу від імені Національної академії правих наук України, від імені нашої кафедри, яка є провідною в дослідженні цих і інших цікавих проблем, пов'язаних з правами людини, привітати нас всіх з цією подією, яка сьогодні відбувається, і побажати всім нам такої плідної, цікавої роботи і досягнення конкретних результатів, оскільки такі висновки, такі пропозиції зараз вкрай необхідні для нашої держави, для наших законотворчих органів, для тих комітетів Верховної Ради, які займаються подібними питаннями, для інших державних органів, для органів правопорядку, для судових вищих органів, для Конституційного суду, тому що я тут абсолютно підтримую сьогоднішню нашу тематику і хочу сказати, що дійсно ця проблема, вона з одного боку для нас є відносно, можна сказати, новою, а з іншого боку вона вже давно є реальною і гострою для нас, оскільки довгий час ми знаходилися всі з вами в полоні таких традиційних уявлень щодо проблематики прав людини. Ну, дійсно, якщо подивитися, заглянути в історію політичних і правовчень, то ми бачимо, що сама ідея прав людини, і сама тематика прав людини, і концепції прав людини виникали, перед за все, в контексті відносин держави і людини, в контексті певного протистояння людини і держави, в контексті того, що від держави можуть, як владної організації, як та, яка має певні прерогативи, в тому числі і владні прерогативи, можуть виходити певні небезпеки і загрози для прав людини. Але ситуація міняється, часи йдуть, міняються століття, міняються тисячоліття, міняються і наші погляди на такого типу проблеми. Я вам хочу сказати, що це не тільки ми тут цікавимося такими проблемами в себе в такій академічній і університетському такому середовищі. Зараз такі чи майже такі питання розглядають дуже на багатьох інстанціях. От недавно була конференція в Конційному суді, яку я мав приймати участь. Теж в контексті забезпечення прав людини теж робився акцент на тому, що зараз настав час поміняти наші погляди на витики цієї проблематики. В Верховному суді України була ціла низка конференцій, присвячених певним аспектам цієї теми. І теж йдеться про те, що не так, не повністю ми можемо зрозуміти, проблему забезпечення прав людини, якщо не врахувати цієї ролі бізнесу в цьому процесі. Ситуація, я ще раз хочу сказати, звичайно, що помінялася. Тобто сьогодні в більшій мірі держава повинна виступати вже і виступає вже, можливо, не стільки навіть порушникам прав людини, скільки вона повинна захищати права людини, поважати, захищати забезпечувати реалізацію прав людини, і особливо в сфері бізнесу, і особливо в сфері таких, знаєте, діяльності таких крупних міжнародних корпорацій серйозних, які не дуже схильні до того, щоб поважати не тільки права людини, а й поважати навіть якісь елементарні засади Конституції і національного законодавства. Тому тематика ця є надзвичайно і цікавою, і актуальною. І тут є багато про що сказати, і багато можна зробити цікавих і плідних висновків. І я хочу подякувати Олені, вона якраз на нашій кафедрі, і, власне кажучи, і підняла цей пласт проблем. Вона його всяким чином, різним чином обґрунтовувала і навіть, я би не сказав, навіть і пробувала цю тематику, тому що не зовсім це для нас таке традиційне бачення. 
Дійсно, протягом от останніх років, останніх десятиліть і кінець 20-го століття, на початку 21-го століття під впливом, перш за все, під впливом таких глобалізаційних процесів, ми бачимо, що ми бачимо, що все більш помітним стає вплив якраз таких недержавних суб'єктів на ситуацію, яка пов'язана з забезпеченням і реалізацією прав людини. Як я вже говорив, особи, крупні компанії, корпорації особливо, величезні такі корпорації, світові корпорації, вони абсолютно не схильні до того, щоб врахуватися з такими речами, врахуватися з правами людини. І вплив бізнесу на права людини, він зачіпає сьогодні різноманітних суб'єктів. Це можуть бути і працівники самі цих корпорацій, і мігранти, і уразливі групи людей, це і діти, і люди з інвалідністю, і люди похилого віку. Це можуть бути різні способи цього впливу. Це і дискримінація, і пряма експлуатація може бути, і нанесення шкоди навколишньому середовищу, і... Це проявляється в різних сферах економічної діяльності. Це і агропромисловий комплекс, звичайно, і текстильна промисловість, і енергетична сфера, і фінансові послуги, і освітні послуги, і медичні послуги, і таке інше. І якраз бізнесу в цих умовах в першу чергу адресується така вимога поважати права людини при здійсні такого, такої діяльності. Причому як в межах національного законодавства, в межах національних кордонів, так і поза такими межами. Як в межах конкретних підприємств, так і на межі господарської діяльності, які здійснюються цими підприємствами. І вже сьогодні в сфері міжнародного законодавства, міжнародного права напрацьовано багато цікавих документів, які є такими керівними засадами для розуміння цих проблем і, для, і головне для забезпечення прав людини у відносинах з бізнесом, особливо з таким крупним, крупним бізнесом, міжнародним бізнесом, глобальним бізнесом. Це і рекомендації Комітету міністрів держав, членів щодо прав людини і бізнесу від 2 березня 2016 року, які були прийняті на рівні Ради Європи. Це і праве регулювання господарської діяльності в найбільш розвинутих країнах світу, таких як Сполучені Штати Америки, в країнах європейської спільноти і таке інше. І не останню роль в цих процесах відіграють і міжнародні і регіональні організації, в тому числі і урядові організації, опрацювання правих позицій різних судових інституцій. І все це в результаті сприяє такому баченню, що потрібно модифікувати і змінювати саму концепцію прав людини. Тобто прямим адресатам відповідних вимог щодо дотримання прав людини сьогодні має виступати не лише держава, як це завжди було прийнято, а й бізнес. Ну, зокрема, ухвалення Радою ООН з, з прав людини в червні 2011 року керівник принципів ООН щодо бізнесу та прав людини передбачає, як принаймні, три таких основних засади. Це перше, це обов'язок держави захищати права людини від порушень з боку третіх осіб, в тому числі з боку бізнесу. Це обов'язок який передбачає необхідність забезпечувати ефективну імплементацію міжнародних стандартів прав людини до рівня національного. Друге – це обов'язок бізнесу поважати прав людини, які включає в себе, і необхідність проявляти належну обачність щодо можливого негативного впливу тієї чи іншої бізнес-діяльності на права людини. Це і на працівників, і на споживачів, і місцеві громади, і постачальники, і таке інше. І третій – Аспект – це забезпечення ефективних засобів захисту – судових, державних, позасудових, недержавних і таке інше. Таким чином, я хочу завершити тим, що, власне, я і починав, що це для нас цікава і актуальна проблема. Ми вже знаходимося під впливом таких міжнародних корпорацій, під впливом таких крупних бізнесових організацій, як міжнародних, так і всередині країни. 
і настав час для того, щоб дослід, досліджувати цю проблему, і не тільки досліджувати, а формулювати певні рекомендації, певні пропозиції для того, щоб можна було приймати відповідні законодавчі рішення. Дякую. Дуже-дуже дякуємо за такі важливі акценти. І, власне, я хочу передати слово знову пану Єрнею Черничу, який є співзасновником регіональної асоціації з бізнесу і прав людини, і який зараз представить таку цікаву доповідь щодо верховенства права в концепції бізнесу і прав людини. І взагалі я дуже рекомендую публікації а, пана Чернича. А, зокрема, я, власне, зараз читаю його дуже цікаву книгу щодо а, відповідальності бізнесу поважати соціальні та економічні права, що наразі є, вона написана ще до COVID-19, але зараз набуває ще додаткової актуальності. І тому ну, будь ласка, пане Чернич, вам слово. Thank you very much. Uh, Oleana, I'm just switching to my screen. Okay. Can you see it? Yes, everything is okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lana. Thank, thank you very much again for organizing this uh, uh, fantastic event uh, on business human rights in Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, thank you also to Professor uh, Petrishin. Uh, fortunately, we cannot be there in Kharkiv, but nonetheless, I'm, I'm sending you my greetings from, uh, from Ljubljana, uh, Slovenia, and hopefully next year we we can repeat this uh, in person. Now, uh, my talk today will be on the, on the rule of law in business and human rights in Central and uh, Eastern Europe. And I will go, I'll go through some of the general common issues of uh, rule of law challenges in uh, Central and Eastern Europe as far as they, they concern business and uh, human rights. Obviously, uh, among uh, 23, 24 countries, there, um, there are differences, different differences, but nonetheless, there are some common features we could uh, agree on. Now, when, when I talk about the rule of law, uh, definitely I, I refer here to the, to the basic principles of the rule of law, such as uh, legal certainty, uh, equality uh, of protection before law, uh, separation of powers, legal flexibility, and so on. Those sub principles of rule of law which are common to the most uh, legal systems in Central Eastern Europe. But more importantly, I understand rule of law as, uh, as Martin Krieger, which is an Australian constitutional law scholar, uh, explains it. And he explains rule of law as a, as a mechanism which uh, limits or curtails the power of um, institutional uh, governing elites uh, in a particular legal system. But not only institutional elites, but also informal elites, if you want, uh, also business elites in, um, in particular countries, so that we understand uh, what I'll be referring uh, to uh, under the rule of law. So I understand rule of law, as a concept which has to, a lot to do with uh, limiting the power of uh, those who, who govern societies, either institutionally or, or informally. Now, uh, the main two questions I'll address here in my talk are, the first, uh, how, how well uh, have been human rights uh, protected in the business operations in Central Eastern Europe? And uh, the second one, uh, do uh, the victims have a viable uh, recourse to justice in a case of uh, uh, violations? Uh, in Central Eastern Europe, there are many common problems uh, which countries share. Obviously, there, there are differences between the countries, as I, as I already said, and uh, there are differences, you know, one could, uh, one could divide Central Eastern Europe in a, at least in uh, two to three groups. Uh, 
one group would be the countries which, countries which are now members of the European Union. So those are countries from the Central Europe uh, and, uh, and Balkan, Baltic countries. And then the second group would be the countries which, which uh, uh, consist of uh, Southern Eastern European countries, countries such as Croatia, Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, uh, Kosovo, Macedonia, and the countries which uh, uh, form part of, uh, of a region which formerly belonged to Soviet, uh, Soviet Union. Uh, obviously, when we talk about common features of CA domestic systems, we could, uh, in most cases, not all cases, obviously, perhaps here the exemptions are uh, Baltic states, at least some of the Baltic states, and some of Central and Eastern European countries, Central, uh, uh, Central European countries. And the common features one could find are weak, uh, weak institutions of uh, rural, rural states, uh, often weak civil society, and this uh, thereby uh, creates a low level of trust of people in institutions. So people in Central Eastern Europe, uh, not often they, they trust into the functioning of judiciary, uh, executive and legislative powers of the, uh, of the government. And obviously there are many instances as to the vicar of law. There are many, the many instances of uh, systematic uh, widespread corruption. Uh, if you look at the Transparency International Index of uh, Perception of Corruption, uh, the countries of Central Eastern Europe, uh, uh, obviously they are, they are different places, but the, uh, mostly the countries which come from a uh, former Soviet, Soviet bloc, uh, there is a wide perception of, uh, of corruption being present in those, uh, in those uh, countries. Perhaps to less degree in a country such as uh, Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Slovenia, Czech Republic, and, and Poland. Poland and often uh, we, 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 we witness also the presence of um, actual and potential conflicts of interest, not only within the state of institutions, uh, but also beyond. When, uh, when, we are, we, when we start talking about uh, the presence of businesses and uh, you know, the freedom to do business in, in a Central Eastern uh, uh, Europe often uh, often investors complain of uh, actual and potential conflicts of uh, interest. And uh, if you continue with the common features of Central Eastern uh, domestic uh, system, uh, systems, one could say that there is a lack of internalization of rural values and perhaps also of uh, human rights standards. And this can be seen uh, from a number of judgments of uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, finding violations of uh, European uh, Convention on Human Rights. Those countries are uh, at the top among the countries with the highest number of uh, judgments coming from the European Court of Human Rights. And uh, this is very much connected also to the lack of subsidiarity. Often, you know, ordinary people in Central Eastern Europe uh, feel that their domestic judiciaries cannot really protect their rights and they consider European Court of Human Rights as, a, as some kind of domestic court, you know, and that results in a really high number of vacations from, uh, from the region to the, to the Strasbourg Court, uh, and, uh, which is hardly, covering, hardly coping with the number of vacations. And that's why uh, they're considering also to limit the access to the court because of this high volume of the applications they, they, they receive. And uh, not, not, uh, not, uh, not the least uh, commentators often uh, describe uh, the old practices and old boys networks uh, and vested interest are still present in the, in the governing constitutions in uh, Central Eastern Europe and uh, the presence of status quo uh, which uh, does not really protect the rule of law, but often when we talk about uh, our region, uh, commentators mention, mention not rule of law, but rule by law, you know, just applying the law uh, to, the, to the interest of, um, of uh, former or informal uh, elites. 
now when we're talking about uh, the areas of concern concerning the business of your business and human rights which are the areas where where uh, perhaps which rights are the most at stake in central eastern europe well it's hard to make a, a difference between the different categories of of uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms but nonetheless uh, one could mention labor rights which uh, uh, when workers have um, very low levels of protections in uh, businesses across Central and Eastern uh, Europe, uh, very far away from the standards of uh, Northern Europe. And then obviously also civil and political rights are, are a danger. Often we see business colliding with the government in order to suppress human rights defenders. Now, there are many cases from um, uh, deep Eastern Europe where human rights uh, defenders have to had to flee the country in order to protect the, uh, the, the, themselves. But this is, of course, connected with the uh, you know the the symbiosis between the government and business business inter interests. Uh, for example, in her last book, uh, Catherine Belton, uh, former financial times a journalist, the book is called uh, Putin's People. She, she documents how, how uh, Russian uh, elites uh, present in the government, they slowly took over the Russian economy to the detriment of Russian people and to the detriment of their human rights and fundamental, fundamental freedoms. Of course, this is not a new argument, but there are many evidence and doc documents which testify to that. Of course, in this regard, uh, one could also mention the, the, the right to fair, independent and impartial tribunal. There are many challenges in this regard, how to ensure independent and impartial trial, uh, both against the businessmen or uh, in issues relating to business human rights. Uh, some of you, remember, you may remember the notorious case, which is still not executed domestically, uh, the case called uh, Khodorovsky and Lebedo you know, versus Russian Federation, where the European Court of Human Rights found uh, uh, a, a number of violations of right to fair trial, but the Russian Federation still has not executed this, this judgment. Challenges. Well, as, as far as business human rights more directly, well, the number of ch challenges, well, most of, most of the countries have difficulties, are very reluctant to, to recognize that um, companies have direct human rights obligations. In most of the national legal systems, you would uh, look in vain for direct uh, corporate human rights uh, obligations. And this is also seen from the national action plans of the few countries which uh, have developed them. Uh, the, 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 the four or five states are very reluctant to recognize that companies have direct human rights obligations. Still, in our region, it seems, and you can compliment me in the, in the, the following discussion. I mean, the states uh, are very reluctant to recognize that companies would have direct human rights obligations. Still, human rights are understood in this vertical relationship with the state individual. Then, weak civil society, this is um, often the problem in the, civil and civil, uh, in the Central Eastern Europe, uh, and access to justice. Oh. Access to justice, often, often uh, judiciary is uh, uh, not very efficient, uh, not very efficient, and it's not very uh, impartial or in, and independent. Uh, as far as the impact of, of international and regional human rights standards on Central and uh, Eastern Europe, uh, one could uh, generally say that uh, the impact has been only partial and limited. Perhaps the most structural and uh, systematic uh, impact uh, is seen in, cent in, cent in Central Europe and Baltic states. But one could, uh, one could um, contend that the liberal values of the European Convention but also the UN guiding principles have not been uh, fully in internalized. Uh, as far as far more direct features of business human rights in Central Eastern Europe, we still see a lot of state involvement in some jurisdictions. 
if it's not through state-owned company, but it's, it, it is through the influence of politics in, uh, in private corporations in uh, some, some uh, countries. And that often leads to the collision of public state and business interests, uh, which go to the determinant of uh, human dignity and, and human rights, fundamental freedoms of individuals and workers, of course. Uh, often we also see, as uh, we already mentioned, weak rule of law and weak institutions and persecution of human rights defenders. Uh, we often hear in business human rights field about the, about the killings of human rights defenders from Central America and South America. No? There are many cases uh, every year, unfortunately. But also in uh, Eastern Europe, particularly in post-Soviet countries, there are a number of cases number of cases where individuals uh, have been prosecuted, they lost their jobs, or even uh, their activities resulted in very, uh, very uh, negative scenarios, uh, not to mention you know, the cases of poisoning or even, even uh, killings in some instances of, of, of human rights defenders, which, which uh, Point to the to the issues which were not to the to the, the to the wishes of the government and largest business corporations. Now, as far as as far as adopted national action plans go, we already mentioned in the first session. Uh, there are four uh, con four countries which are, which have developed so far national action plans: uh, Czech Republic, uh, Lithuania, Poland, Slovenia, Georgia. Has also, has also a special section of business human rights in their national human rights action plan. Of course, this, these four or five national action plans, they differ in the in length, quality, and the commitment of the government. Uh, if you look, for example, at the national action plan of the uh, Republic of Lithuania, it's very, it's very short. Uh, whereas uh, some other national action plans, such as uh, Polish, Czech and Slovenia, they're more, uh, they're, they're more elaborated. As far uh, as far as the current stage of the development goes, Beata, Beata already mentions that uh, the important they're coming to the to the end of the development, developing uh, a new updated national action plan. In Slovenia, also uh, there is a. We are coming to the to the to the cl uh, conclusion of the first cycle. Of of the supervision of the Slovenian National Action Plan, but the, the representative of the Slovenian government will one, in one of the sessions will talk about a bit more on, the, on this. As far as other developments uh, in business human rights are, are concerned, uh, we could here mention national action plans, national contact, contact points under the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. As you know, OECD is the it's a, it's a club of countries which are most developed in the world. And some of our Central European states are members of it. And uh, five, five countries have functioning national contact points, Czech Republic, Georgia, Lithuania, Poland, Slovenia. And all of these uh, national contact points have in one or, or more cases dealt with uh, complaints concerning uh, potential and violation of OECD guidance for national uh, for uh, for uh, multinational enterprises. Now, challenges. If if I coming to the I'm coming to uh, to the conclusion, what are challenges for business human rights in Central Euro Eastern Europe in the next dec decade? Oh, my take here would be the biggest challenge. The, big, the biggest challenge, as in many uh, regional contexts, is, is uh, how to improve access to justice. How to improve the fairness and independence of uh, judiciary or other, other bodies who, who address corporate equitability in our regions. Also, how to improve weak institutions and the rule of law. But obviously, I mean, these are the general questions which, which go beyond business and human rights. No? Uh, and, and also, how to eradicate or, lo or lower the levels of. Um, of corruption and how to ensure that conflicts of interest will not be so present as they are at this moment in, in, the, in the region. So this is my presentation and uh, unfortunately I will, I will have to go now, but uh, 
uh, I will put my email address in the chat room. So if any of you will have a specific question in this regard, please feel uh, to drop me an email and uh, we'll also have another session tomorrow, Olana, no? if I'm not mistaken, in the morning on, on the challenges uh, for business rights in Central Eastern Europe for the next 10 years. So thank you and all the best. Thank you very much, uh, dear Irene, and uh, I think that, uh, yes, a lot of uh, questions, uh, um, our participants have a lot of questions to you, um, and uh, it's um, great that we will have the uh, opportunity uh, to hear you tomorrow again. Um, mm. Unfortunately, yes, the journey should uh, leave us at this moment, and that's why I will give the Thank you very much, Elena, again. And um, well, what I will be presenting, let me just share my. Oh, I cannot share the screen, I'm afraid. So, um, Yanni, are you still sharing or is it. Um, let me check. No? Okay, now I'm stopping. Fantastic, cool. Sorry. No, not a problem. Okay, so um, I hope that it's visible now. Um, what I'll be speaking for the next around 10 minutes about, um, it's are the developments at the EU level and the recommendations for the mandatory human rights due diligence legislation. And the reason why I've chosen to speak about that is that even though the session is about the research on and in Central and Eastern Europe, the fact, uh, given the fact that a number of countries from the region are actually members of the EU, means that um, our legislation, our economy will be, in a way, affected and regulated by um, the legislation that, um, as it seems, as of next year, will start to be uh, developed. Um, why I think it's crucial. I was very tempted actually to talk today about some of the work that we've done on kind of um, on the issue of forced labor, but then I thought that I'll talk about it tomorrow because it's kind of more of an ongoing and kind of very practical, um, practice oriented. It's kind of less research, although to develop some of the tools uh, to guide companies on how to prevent forced labor, we actually needed to do quite substantial research. Um, and that, uh, for those who do not know, Polish Institute for Human Rights, which I'm representing, we are an independent non-profit foundation. We are a private entity. We are not a state research institution, but we do a lot of research, uh, both academic, but also policy-oriented one. And um, some of the research that I want to present today uh, is actually this kind of policy-oriented research that was meant to underpin some of the considerations around um, development of the position of the European Parliament on how um, human rights due diligence legislation at the European level should look like. And um, why I think it's important, I mean, unfortunately, as Yenne has said and how, how it was mentioned a number of times before uh, today, well, we don't really see a lot of action from the side of the state government, from, from the side of the government and state, well, not maybe also state institutions, but for sure governments and parliaments, you don't see much of the legislative action, even though as part of some of our activities we've developed and consulted broadly with academics, with practitioners, for example, definition of the forced labor to be included into the Polish criminal code but unfortunately, Ministry of Justice didn't think it's important to kind of respond to that and um, include it in the criminal court, which, and the lack of the, this definition is basically one of the very important barriers, very important challenges to actually holding people accountable for the use of forced labor. Hence why we are also putting a lot of attention and our research time into the research on uh, which concerns legislation at the European level with the hope that once this will be developed and adopted, uh, we will well, basically state 
governments, uh, state administration will need to simply implement it. And they will have different options of how to do it, but basically they will have to, let's say, implement it into domestic legal system. Hence why from at least those uh, countries in Central Eastern Europe that are members of the EU, um, those developments at the EU level are so important. And the research that I want to talk, uh, talk about very briefly is um, the research that we've developed together with Professor Markus Krajewski, um, as requested by the European Parliament. We've been asked by the Trois Committee, so the committee which focuses on human rights, uh, to provide them with advice of what should be the substantive elements of such potential legislation on human rights. And um, it should be stated that earlier this year, I mean, the Parliament requested this research earlier. They've requested it already at the turn of the year. Uh, in April uh, 2020, European Commissioner um, uh, Didier uh, Reinders actually confirmed that European Commission will be developing legislation on mandatory human rights due diligence at the EU level starting from 2021. Um, so the more our research turned to be yeah, very timely. Uh, the way we've approached it, I mean, obviously there is plenty of discussion and plenty of secondary um, literature about what and what um, mandatory human rights diligence should cover, how it should be structured. Um, we've decided to go to the basics, so we've decided to base our research solely on, uh, basically, on the primary sources, on the legislative acts, and we've looked into both national laws that have elements of mandatory human rights due diligence, and you'll see those listed here on the website, uh, on the slide. And um, we've also looked into some of the EU legislative acts, as well as some proposals for national laws and some of the non-state actors position papers and recommendations, because we thought that obviously um, legislation which is adopted is normally an outcome of quite a number of discussions and it's basically a compromise between different um, actors, be it civil society and business and state or and trade unions. So therefore we thought it's important also to include some of the position papers and recommendations developed by stakeholders to see what actually they are pushing for um, on their own. Um, obviously, this is not very ex exhaustive list. Of, we could add a number of different legislation. Uh, we were limited both by the time and space which, um, into which we needed to fit this research. And um, we kind of, the briefing which we've developed thus um, discusses key substantive elements of the potential future EU legislation. And this uh, includes obviously options for human rights covered by the due diligence uh, requirement, types of violations, specific references to vulnerable groups, so like women or per other people in vulnerable situations or human rights defenders, um, people with disabilities and so on. And also we were discussing the issue of what companies should be covered and also the duties of companies. Uh, to respect and protect human rights. And um, I think we've developed this research um, kind of with one basic tenet in mind, namely that while developing mandatory human rights due diligence legislation is certainly a very complex endeavor, it's still kind of the basic things that one needs to bear in mind is that the aim of this legislation is to ensure respect for humans. And it's in, to ensure respect for the rights of humans. And um, those shouldn't be sacrificed for the sake of the company profits or accumulation of wealth or kind of the easiness of the implementation. Um, because if we just choose to protect certain rights and not the others, we'll be just really on the downhill slope. And we've seen it in some of the countries in the region, including my own, that the situation when the state starts stops protecting some rights um, just leads us nowhere and it actually leads to the greater polarization and greater division and hatred among people. So um, what we've recommended, and we'll go, uh, I'll try to go um, one by one, uh, is um, first of all, when it comes to the scope of the human rights covered, we've 
recommended that basically human rights legis mandatory human rights due diligence legislation should cover all human rights. And um, while we think that it's not necessary to list um, the core documents, still probably for the sake of the clarity for business and to provide some clear guidance, it might be useful to include in this legislation a reference to the core of the human rights. So the Universal Declaration, the Two Covenants, some other global human rights treaties, the core ILO standards and other internationally accepted instruments of human rights, such as the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People and the People with Disabilities as well, which is actually not mentioned here. But, um, but so, um, basically we kind of followed in terms of selection, we think that it would make sense to follow the suit of the UN guiding principles and provide the same core list of instruments simply to keep it uh, because we think that it's actually comprehensive enough. Um, however, we also stated that obviously the human rights diligence legislation should also explicitly refer um, to the special needs, maybe not special rights, but the special needs of specific vulnerable groups. And to that effect, it probably would be useful to mention some of the kind of uh, group specific um, treaties like CEDAW, uh, CRC, C CRPD, and, and so on. However, it's not that we think that there should be a very huge section dedicated. It's more for the purpose of indicating that when companies will be prioritizing issues that they should address, they should keep in mind the needs of special groups and that, um, that they don't overlook the rights of women gender issues that they don't overlook the issue of human rights defenders or indigenous people depending on, um, on sector. So um, while, so in a way we want to emphasize this universal and divisible character of human rights, but we also kind of want to think that it would be useful in such legislation to point to specific um, groups and their needs. Then um, there is a lot of discussion about whether mandatory human rights due diligence should be limited to severe violations or uh, of human rights or just cover certain types of violations. Like obviously we've got some specific national level legislations that for example, focuses only on the modern slavery. Well, we didn't thought that this is the right approach. Our recommendation is that the legislation should actually build, um, should actually cover all human rights all types of human rights and, but what is needed is certainly to use the language of UNGP's principle 24, which states that companies need to prioritize and that they should focus on the situation and activities with more severe impacts. And um, this is kind of trying to combine kind of the legal orthodoxy with the practical approach. Uh, we obviously understand that just as countries don't have unlimited resources, so companies do not. And independent of how big companies are, still their resources are limited. And therefore it's important to realize that they won't change their behavior, that they won't fix all the things that should be fixed from day one to day two, and that it takes time. And that it's core that they really are, that they map where they have impact and that they prioritize it. And um, we don't think that it would kind of detract from their accountability and ability to um, punish them for the violations of human rights, which by the way, uh, European Commission stated that it will be um, separate, that it will be working on a separate legislation as well that would, that is meant to be covering um, legal liability for violations of human rights. So there is a chance that there will be parallel work going on human rights due diligence, which is about what companies should do to prevent, and the legislation which would cover uh, situations when company has failed. And there was a violation that took place and somebody needs to be held accountable for that. Um, then when it comes to the companies covered, another hot topic um, when it comes to those discussions, should all companies be covered or only those transnational ones? And, We've recommended, obviously, that all companies either domiciled in the EU member states or placing products or providing services in the internal market, regardless of their size and sector, 
should be covered. And that's because just like a small company, small domestic companies that simply, let's say, imports very toxic material or just paint and stores it inadequately. Um, and there might be fires, there might be some leakages that might have a very grief impact on people living around and actually workers as well. So the impact can be really very, very big. It can be deathly, independent of whether you are a transnational company or just a company that employs one or two people. So there shouldn't be differentiation in terms of who is covered. However, obviously there will be different, or there should be different in our opinion, requirements as to what need, what specific corporation needs to do. So just as we see uh, with regards to the non-financial reporting that it covers only, that this obligation covers only the biggest companies, we could see that, for example, everybody is obliged obviously to respect and ensure due diligence, but for example, small and medium companies are not required to, let's say, to write reports about it, but they are absolutely uh, required, for example, to make sure that they actually map um, their potential negative impacts and that they are aware of how things can go wrong and that they do things to prevent it from happening. Um, then we've got also issue of business um, activities covered and um, we also obviously uh, highlight that it's important to cover not only companies own activities but also business relations including the supply chain and that means that the kind of this pressure point comes from the fact that there is a very big, um, let's say, creativity um, among business about how to circumvent uh, different legislative attempts to regulate it. So there are different ways of how to go about the regulations concerning employment relationships and so on. So if we cover the supply chain, if we cover the business relations with such legislation, there will be less possibility and let's say attractiveness for a business in trying to circumvent the law. And um, finally, um, having regard to the limited effectiveness of just mere reporting and transparency requirements, we think that um, the future human rights due diligence legislation needs to adopt a very substantive due diligence model and require companies to engage very actively in analyzing and mitigating and remedying adverse impacts on human rights. And we've seen some of the um, examples of how this can be done also in France. I know that there is a mixed um, kind of feedback from the field about how effective it is, but still it's kind of into the direction that we would be recommending. And there are also some other suggestions which you can find also in our paper um, that um, NGOs that civil society has put forward in terms of um, for example, companies being uh, required to document active actions that they take and so on. So um, obviously um, mandatory human rights diligence at EU level is not enough, uh, but we also need to have requirements for states to make sure that um, they actually undertake all the action possible to implement it in a way that guarantees um, strong level of enforcement and that is supplemented by the remedy mechanisms. Obviously, I haven't touched here on the elements concerning um, access to remedy in this context. Our research didn't focus on it and I also, I mean, I could say a lot about it, but I think I'm already um, out of time. So uh, thank you for your attention. If you would have any questions, please, um, you know, get in touch and I'll put my email and also the link to the um, well, uh, to the paper into the chat in a moment. Thank you very much. I hope that the English interpretation will be available, will be available for Beata. Um, uh, Beata, are you hearing in English? Yeah? Okay. 
Власне, хотілося б декілька питань зараз задати, оскільки в нас є така чудова можливість подискутувати з Б'ятою Фарачик, яка є однією з провідних експерток в регіоні і в цілому в Європейському Союзі з бізнесу і прав людини, яка дуже підтримує нас, власне, з 2017 року у розвитку цього напрямку в Україні. І в гостях у нас була на Харківському форумі, і ми дуже цінуємо цю підтримку. Бята, оскільки в нас не було можливості через те, що Єрний зайнятий в іншому заході, запитати в нього щодо верховенства права, але ваші доповіді частково пов'язані. Як ви вважаєте, чи запровадження обов'язкового Human Rights Due Diligence вплине на рівень верховенства права в країнах? І чи можна Можна взагалі вважати вимоги Human Rights Due Diligence елементами верховенства права? Well, um, I would say it's definitely interconnected, just as um, Yane pointed, but I would say rule of law is the basic, it's the background um, that would make this legislation effective. The problem is that if you don't have a well-functioning, um, basically, uh, even judicial system, if you do have plenty of interactions between politicians and, um, and the business sphere, I mean, obviously, the implementation might go, might, might just be very ineffective and just might go wrong. Um, so, yes, we do have a number of fears around whether um, even if the future legislation at the EU level will be a good one. Um, we are concerned as when it comes to its implementation, for example, in Poland and in several other countries, um, because even though it will be implemented in terms of like, the, like the, this kind of legalistic level, right? So it will be well transposed, but then there is an issue of implementation of it in practice. And um, if we have, um, you know, for example, you know, we had a case in Poland, let's, let's say about it, um, uh, concerning IKEA. And I know that IKEA has a number of things going wrong in Ukraine concerning climate issues and forests and so on. Um, in Poland, I mean, there are some other issues, but there is one from on which definitely IKEA is going the right way, which is um, prevention of discrimination. And to be fair, like any other employer, they are bound by law to ensure non-discrimination in the workplace. Uh, last year, we had a situation when um, basically one of the workers, one of the employees has posted a very offensive um, text on intranet, basically quoting also Old Testament, uh, which states that homosexuals should be stoned to death and that they should die and that um, he's against the policy of the company. It was during the Pride Month of supporting um, LGBT people. Um, I mean, there were some discussions, there were some efforts to kind of uh, find the compromise, but in the end, the person didn't uh, want to remove those um, posts and in the end, he was fired. Uh, the situation was checked. I mean, there was control by the, obviously it was a very loud case. Politicians got involved. Um, and do remember, I mean, the company is obliged to ensure non-discriminatory working environment. And that includes freedom from being object of the hate speech and uh, abusive content. And um, so basically we got politicians involved, blah, blah, blah. There were a number of controls. They found that actually company has acted in line with the law. So there was a labor inspectorate um, check and um, it found that yes, company did everything right. And one year later this year, um, the head of uh, human resources at IKEA was faced with criminal charges pressed by the prosecutor. And the prosecution, prosecutor in Poland like uh, it's basically the same person as the Minister of Justice. Basically, Minister of Justice is slash um, Prosecutor General. So it was kind of generated for political reasons to kind of create specific impact, specific effect on companies. And you can imagine the reaction of companies. Okay, so we are now kind of asked to implement the law on non-discrimination, on the prevention of discrimination. 
And at the same time, we've got, let's say, politicians slash prosecution service going after our uh, employers, employees, which, you know, they shouldn't be. They were acting on behalf of the employer. It wasn't their individual capacity out of work. It wasn't corruption issue. So they shouldn't have individual charges pressed against them in the first place. Um, if there was anything, it should be raised against the company. So you kind of see how the lack of the proper division of, um, of the powers and of the proper rule of law, obviously, kind of interf interferes with how good legislation is and can be implemented. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, we do have a number of concerns and obviously the case will go to the court and so on and we kind of trust, still trust in some of the courts, in some of the um, judges, obviously not no longer in the constitutional court for obvious reasons. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, it is a struggle and I would say rule of law is a precondition for effective functioning of any sort of um, legislation simply because if you don't have the rule of law, I mean, you just don't have, in the end, you don't have courts that will protect you. So, yeah, thanks. Дуже, дуже дякуємо Бяті. Взагалі виглядає так, ну, в останній час дуже часто використовують таку формулу, що людство має укласти новий соціальний договір, да, і, власне, стороною цього договору має бути не тільки держава, як носій певних обов'язків да, перед е, людиною, але й бізнес. І якщо в цю теоретичну площину переходити, то, можливо, процедури Human Rights Due Diligence – це, власне, елемент цього нового соціального договору, тому що, якщо до держави е, людство виробило вимоги стримувані проти ваг, то, можливо, якраз Human Rights Due Diligence – це такий аналог для бізнесу, да, певного стримування. Але, звичайно, щоб є багато питань, багато дискусій з цього приводу, і, власне, той момент, який Біата трошки зачепила, що той бізнес, який хоче працювати в країнах з низьким рівнем захисту прав людини, і ми маємо знайти механізми, як забезпечити все рівно повагу бізнесом прав людини навіть в таких країнах, чи не призведе це, що бізнес втратить інтерес працювати в цих країнах, бо ми розуміємо, що це для нього питання, ну, власне, бізнес-моделі, да? їм вигідно працювати в таких країнах, якщо на них будуть більше контролювати дотримання прав людини, то інтерес цей пропаде і, відповідно, чи не стануть бідні країни ще біднішими? Так, будь ласка. I just wanted to add two, two things. I mean, there is a positive element because after the situation with IKEA, we actually had a reaction from several companies, like, um, like well, not more than 20 to be fair, but still, um, who kind of turned to us and kind of said, well, you know, we want to do something. I mean, you know, it's, it's not okay. We do want companies to know that if they are required to, to be, to create discrimination-free environments, they shouldn't be feared to actually do, to implement the law. So um, luckily, I think to some extent, in some parts of business, the mindset is slowly changing and people start to understand that business has a responsibility that goes beyond its its gates and um, I think it's a welcome development uh, to be fair we've been even asked by business from US by some groups from US what companies that are present in Poland could do to kind of support um, their colleagues and so on so yeah um, there is some good development um, happening I would say, definitely. And there are also obviously some developments in some areas. So the problem is the kind of the underlying climate of whether you can trust. Yeah. Thanks. 
Дякуємо, дякуємо дуже. І в нас буде знов таки можливість ще завтра почути Біато Фарачек, бо в нас вже завтра буде ще дискусія щодо саме стану імплементації керівних принципів ООН в різних країнах регіону. І Біата Фарачек буде більше розповідати про Польщу. Дякуємо. І я зараз хочу передати слово пані Єкатерині Дейкало, яка представляє, власне, Білорусь. І а, вона працює на кафедрі міжнародного права факультету міжнародних відносин Білоруського державного університету і а, є авторкою, співавторкою і ідейною натхненницею а, першої в регіоні, ну я скажу так, в пострадянському регіоні а, книжки з бізнесу і прав людини і відповідно я дуже рада, дуже рада, що пані Пані Катерина сьогодні до нас доєдналася з надзвичайно цікавою доповіддю щодо ролі і викликів для бізнесу під час мирних протестів в Білорусі, які, ну, власне, наразі тривають. Вітаємо, пані Катерина. Дякую, колеги, я буду сказати вітаю на англійській, але ви чуєте мене? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you very okay. well. Okay, uh, but um, I, um, I'm not sure that I can share my presentation. I can't find the, the um, can't find uh, how to share my presentation. Uh, just mm -hmm. under the foot. To chat next to chat share screen. Yes, yes, I found, but I can't see oh. my presentation in oh, uh, like um, on the computer. Oh yes, I can't see it. Uh, just to choose, I mean, among things that I can choose. Maybe um, so. Uh, just in case, Elena has uh, my presentation as well. Uh, Maybe. Hmm. Uh, yes, one second, please. Mm -hmm. So, um, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much for such opportunity to um, to have a speech in this forum and to participate in this forum. Of course, all of you know what is going on in our country now, and uh, of course, I have to say that it's influenced very much and um, our scientific um, research. Um, and uh, our conditions and physical and moral condition and our working capacity as well. Uh, that's why I'm begging your pardon just in advance that I will speak in Russian and my presentation will be in Russian from kind permission of Elena uh, because it just, uh, frankly speaking, just easy for me now to do this because um, uh, actually it's very hard time for us, uh, for work actually. And uh, if you will interesting, I will I will translate it in English after all, and uh, send to Elena, and I can ask you questions in English as well. So, and I hope that translation um, will be um, will be okay. So, я переключаюсь на русский. Пока Elena включает презентацию. Uh, нужно сказать, что исследование uh, темы бизнеса и прав человека в Беларуси uh, это очень недавняя вообще вещь. Uh, с 2015 года uh, начала тема вообще входить в Беларусь, и Белорусский Хельсинский комитет uh, в первую очередь начал uh, работать с этой темой uh, как правозащитники. И с точки зрения академических исследований тема начала работать uh, в 2015 году. Uh, в 2018 году, и, эм, в общем-то, я человек, который начал исследовать с точки зрения академической эту тему, эм, и э, публикация, которая сегодня есть, она единственная по этой теме, э, в Беларуси э, написана в соавторстве э, э, мной и еще авторами, которые представляют разные сферы наук. К этой теме сразу я подходила 
и вообще это мое убеждение, как ученого нужно подходить в междисциплинарном ключе. Эту тему невозможно исследовать только с точки зрения права, потому что очень много факторов. Бизнес, как участник этих отношений, он за собой влечет очень много факторов, которые влияют на исследование этой темы, на продвижение ее на практике. Поэтому монодисциплинарность невозможна здесь. И а, а, Алена, я буду тогда просить переключать а, вас слайды. Ну, конечно. Ага. А, и а, а можно сделать, чтобы на весь экран, ну, как это, показ. Ага, спасибо большое. И, в общем-то, кроме этого, важно очень э, понимать, что эта тема невозможно исследовать в отрыве от практики. И, э, собственно говоря, поэтому, когда началась эта вся ситуация, э, основное, э, то, чем мы сейчас занимаемся в этой теме, это э, вот э, то, о чем я хочу вам э, кратко рассказать. Э, э, следующий слайд можно? А для, прежде чем э, говорить о том, какие изменения привнесла в ситуация, которая происходит у нас в стране сейчас, э, буквально два слова об исходной точке, о, почему эти изменения нам стали важны сейчас и почему, казалось бы, такая страшная ситуация, э, в общем-то, э, послужила нам, э, действительно сыграла определенную пользу послужила нам какой-то полезной в этом смысле, в, теме, в смысле продвижения темы бизнеса и прав человека. А перед собой вы видите пять основных проблем, которые в том числе и я, исходя из исследований научных, которые я проводила, исходя из практических исследований, на основе которых я проводила свои научные исследования, выявила, это основные проблемы, связанные с развитием темы бизнеса и прав человека в Беларуси. Политизация тематики прав человека – основное из них. Незрелость бизнеса как института социума, низкая правая культура и грамотность самих работников и потребителей, которые не запрашивают снизу соблюдение своих прав. Также, безусловно, это все влияет на приоритетность мотивации работников. Люди часто готовы терпеть какие-то оскорбления и унижения ради того, чтобы не потерять работу, потому что у них достаточно низкий доход, они не знают, где еще найти потом эту работу. Ну и вот отождествление белорусским бизнесом данной темы с благотворительностью в рамках корпоративной и социальной ответственности. В общем-то, все эти проблемы мы можем э, подытожить и покрыть одним большим вопросом, который стоил, стоял перед нами еще зимой э, э, этого года, как продать бизнесу права человека. Э, разговоры, то есть очень надо понимать, что в Беларуси э, ситуация такая с этой темой, что э, разговоры о том, каким образом, да, due diligence там, и все остальное, это еще совершенно как-то очень далеко. И основная наша проблема была в том, как вообще найти точку входа, точку входа в эту тему для бизнеса. Когда мы разрабатывали свое руководство, практическое руководство для бизнеса и прав человека, мы выпустили в прошлом году вместе с Белорусским Кельским комитетом, мы говорили с бизнесами, мы ходили к очень многим бизнесам, чтобы понять их позицию и каким-то образом вовлечь их в эту ситуацию. И они говорили нам только две фразы. Права человека – это политика, мы политикой не занимаемся. Мы понимаем, что это хорошие вещи, но это не для нашего контекста. И таким образом для нас был очень большой вопрос. А что происходит далее зимой? Началась весной, вернее, началась ситуация с ковидом, и летом на нее наложилась ситуация уже, которая касается конкретно нашей страны, избирательной кампании и последовавшие за ней протесты, мирные протесты. Произошел определенный вообще феномен социальный. За два месяца буквально это произошла определенная революция вообще в подходе к этой теме и в ее продвижении. Можно следующий слайд, Алена, пожалуйста. В чем причины 
и основные изменения и их причины. Почему так произошло и что изменилось? Основные причины три я выделяю. Во-первых, это концентрированные формы неуважительного, недостойного, бесчеловечного отношения к людям со стороны государства. На них накладывается правовой дефолт, в котором мы сегодня существуем. Право не работает вообще. Люди понимают, что они не могут быть уверенными ни в чем. Начиная не только касательно там какого-то задержания, да, но и касательно э, того, что ты можешь вешать у себя в окне, да, э, людей заставляют снимать флаги э, из окон, то есть и совершенно не аргументируя это какими-то э, нормативными, э, нормативной базой, вообще правовыми аргументами, потому что их нет. И третий, третья причина – это беспрецедентная гражданская эмпатия. А, образование за два месяца буквально абсолютно нового общества, горизонтальной системы связи в обществе, которой не было вообще. Вот эти три причины, а, это еще раз подтверждает междисциплинарный подход а, к теме бизнеса и права человека, и то, что необходимо именно его использовать, они повлияли очень сильно на, на вот эти проблемы, которые были на предыдущем слайде, которые существуют да, в Беларуси. Основные три, три, собственно говоря, изменения вы видите на слайде. Что происходит? Происходит деполитизация прав человека. Большинство людей наконец-то поняли, что права человека – это не что-то, за что борется какая-то оппозиция. Это то, что касается каждого из нас сегодня дома, на улице. Люди, оставшись без определенной защиты государства в правовом дефолте, начали исключительно резко самообразовываться и повышать свою правовую грамотность, потому что, когда ты понимаешь, что ты должен, тебя там вызывают повесткой, ты должен прийти, и ты должен сам как бы знать свои права, никто тебе их не расскажет, да, вот, и то же самое касательно бизнеса, когда работодатель начинает тебя ущемлять, или там ты как клиент, люди абсолютно, то есть очень большой произошел всплеск интереса вообще к праву, к их правам, и, соответственно, произошел отсюда Вывод – общественный запрос на соблюдение бизнесом прав человека. Потому что когда люди почувствовали себя людьми, извините да, за такую фразу, естественно, они стали требовать к себе другого отношения. И третье изменение огромное, которое повлекли вот эти события – бизнес, это уже мотивация бизнеса. Бизнес увидел, что его лояльность человеку монетизируется моментально. То есть очень важно еще в этой теме понимать, что мы не можем исключительно насаждать и обязывать бизнес э, и объяснять ему, что он должен соблюдать права человека просто потому, что он должен. Хотя на самом деле, да, это так. Очень правильно говорила сейчас Лена, что бизнесу удобно работать там, где у него меньше проблем. Но э, здесь есть еще очень важная э, вещь. А, Бизнес, очень важно понимать, что мы должны, продавая права человека бизнесу, мы должны сделать так, чтобы он сам захотел, чтобы он понял, что это экономически выгодно, чтобы он понял, что соблюдение им прав человека а, отражается на экономических, а, имеет экономический эффект, имеет репутационный эффект. И вы знаете, вот как раз в этой ситуации, которая сейчас происходит у нас, а, бизнес увидел это буквально вот за несколько, просто за месяц. Я потом, когда закончу, могу более подробно остановиться на конкретных кейсах, просто чтобы сейчас уже не занимать время. Можно следующий слайд? Эти все изменения, три основные изменения, деполитизация прав человека, общественный запрос на права человека со стороны, на соблюдение прав человека, со стороны людей, и э, запрос э, и изменение мотивации бизнеса э, выводят как бы, на поверхность две такие проблемы, которые не требуют научного исследования, безусловно, с опором на практику. 
Первая из них, Алина, нажмите, пожалуйста, первая из них – это первый блок проблем содержательный. Эта ситуация вывела на поверхность очень большую, большой массив вообще случаев нарушения бизнесом именно не социальных экономических прав, а, как обычно мы в основном говорим, да, о нарушении бизнеса прав в связке вот с социально-экономическими правами, потому что это часто касается отношений бизнеса и работника, и почему-то все подразумевают это в первую очередь. Сейчас на поверхность вышла огромный пласт э, нарушения бизнеса гражданских и политических прав. Мы знаем случаи, был такой случай, когда, например, внутренним распоряжением в одной частной фирме директор выпустил э, распоряжение о запрете ношения белых браслетов, э, потому что, я цитирую, они символизируют гибридную войну. Это документ, который совершенно официальный, и э, за это предусматривалось, соответственно, документом э, дисциплинарное взыскание. Безусловно, это противоречит трудовому законодательству, э, но, опять же, э, на сегодняшний день мы говорим о правовом дефолте, и человек совершенно не уверен вообще, могут ли правовые аргументы работать. И второй блок проблем – это методологически. И вот на нем подробнее, буквально сейчас еще два слова. Исходя из того, какие изменения произошли в, этом, в этой теме и в отношении бизнеса к этому, буквально за два месяца сформировалось да, новое общество, и это общество начало включать общественные механизмы. Очень важно вместе с этим понимать, чтобы это не осталось на уровне эмоциональных порывов, а чтобы каким-то образом превратить попытку бизнеса включиться в повестку прав человека в системный подход и не оставить появившиеся механизмы общественного давления на уровне охоты на ведьм. Можно следующий слайд? А, механизм blaming and shaming, который также, о котором также говорит поясняющее руководство к руководящим принципам, он да, основной механизм в контексте общественного давления – и регуляции поведения бизнеса в контексте соблюдения прав человека. Произошел абсолютно, да, еще раз повторю, взрыв вообще таких инициатив, буквально с уровня Zero до э, появляется Blacklist 2020, сайт с перечнем брендов, поддерживающих э, Лукашенко и его силовиков. Появляется приложение для телефона Крама с белорусского магазин, которое по QR-коду разно распознает производителей лояльных режимов, нарушающих права работников. Это все появляется буквально за два месяца, и люди активно начинают этим пользоваться, бизнес видит, опять же, вот эти все эффекты, но можно, Алина, след... нажать, какие возникают вопросы? Вопросы возникают э, такого рода. Э, понимаете, что сегодня общество разделено у нас на два больших лагеря, свой, чужой. Это неизбежно, наверное, в таких ситуациях. И, соответственно, возникает э, вопрос методологического плана, да, если мы не хотим оставить вот э, эти механизмы, которые будут работать на уровне фильтрации бизнеса по его политической лояльности, если мы хотим действительно основательно включить механизмы, которые будут работать с тем, чтобы видеть все нюансы нарушения бизнеса прав человека. Потому что ведь, опять же, попадать, то есть возникает вопрос первый критерий, на основании которых бизнес попадает в эти списки. Каковы эти критерии? Кто их устанавливает? Есть очень разные, как бы мы знаем, что у нас есть прямое нарушение бизнеса прав человека, косвенное нарушение бизнеса прав человека и Нарушение прав человека через деловые связи, когда ты находишься в цепи поставок того, кто нарушает права человека. И мы должны понимать, что исходя из того, насколько ты э, включен в нарушение права человека, последствия для тебя, и они должны быть, безусловно, разные, да, это не должно быть поголовное какое-то просто, ну, охота на ведьм, да, как я уже сказала. Поэтому очень важны э, подход к разработкам критерий, на основании которых будет бизнес попадать в эти списки. Далее проблема выявления нарушений. То есть для того, чтобы э, эти списки и приложения э, превратились в системные вещи и не оставались, опять же, на уровне просто свой-чужой, поверхностном, да, и выхолощенном, очень важна верификация таких нарушений, кто их будет верифицировать, э, каким образом их выявлять, э, фиксировать. 
потому что, опять же, в нашей ситуации есть очень много случаев, когда в сети появляется информация о том, что такой магазин, например, дискриминирует покупателей, которые приходят с бочевой символикой или белыми браслетами и заявляет о том, что он будет поддерживать только покупателей, которые поддерживают режим Лукашенко, но через час появляется заявление директора магазина э, с тем, что э, такого вообще нет, и ее телефон, и она говорит о том, что это происки конкурентов, и мы обслуживаем всех, извините, пожалуйста. То есть в данном случае вопросы верификации сейчас стоят очень остро, верификации информации. Вы понимаете, что в такой ситуации э, как бы очень много, в том числе, фейковой информации, которая уходит в паблик очень быстро, не проверяется. И опять же, третий большой вопрос – это удаление из этих списков. Да? На каком основании, после, как, после, скажем, после чего бизнес должен быть удален из этих списков и не нести больше вот этот вот на себе как бы бремя blaming and shaming, он после того, как он возмещает определенный ущерб, после того, как он делает какие-то публичные заявления. То есть вот эти вопросы методологического плана, они выплывают на поверхность параллельно с такими стихийно организованными и очень эффективными и очень хорошими э, инициативами, которые родились в нашем новом обществе. Следующий слайд, Алена. Спасибо. Следующий слайд можно включить. Спасибо большое, коллеги. Uh, thank you for your attention. И I hope that it was interesting. So I'm waiting for your question. Дуже, дуже дякуємо Катерині. Це дійсно дуже цікаво ще й з огляду на те, що тематика бізнесу і прав людини доволі рідко розглядається в контексті от політичних і громадянських прав, і тому, звичайно, що цей аспект є надзвичайно цікавим для нас. Ми ще сподіваємося, що в нас буде час для запитань від учасників. Наразі я Хочу передати слово нашому колезі з Литви, який представляє наш партнерський власне вуз, вуз Миколаса Рамереса. І ми дуже заздримо нашим колегам, тому що в них PhD дисертації готуються з тематики бізнесу і прав людини. І, власне, я хочу сказати, що цей досвід в світі також є. Наприклад, от Даніла Памплона, яка сьогодні брала участь, яка працює в Бразилії, професоркою, в неї окрема PhD програма з бізнесу і прав людини. І я сподіваюся, звичайно, що ми також будемо мати таку практику. І сьогодні вже декілька разів зачіпали питання належних засобів правового захисту від порушень в сфері бізнесу і прав людини. І це одна з трьох ключових основ керівних принципів ООН з бізнесу і прав людини – наявність ефективних правових засобів захисту. І тому ми дуже раді, що сьогодні пан Арнес доєднався до нас і представить саме доповідь щодо правових засобів захисту у сфері бізнесу і прав людини. Окей, uh, hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, very well. Yes. Uh, so, that's very nice to see uh, this gathering at Kharkiv University. Um, uh, thank you, Olena, for inviting me to this conference. I'm really pleased, and um, as Olena, Olena said, uh, I'm a PhD student at Mykolas Romers University of Lithuania, and also a member of Human Rights uh, Laboratory. And uh, mostly my focus is related to business and uh, human rights issues, um, quite various uh, questions, starting with national action plans. But uh, currently I'm writing uh, an article on to access to remedy and I thought that it would be very nice to discuss uh, some questions. So uh, I will hope that there will be no difficulties to share the presentation. Uh, so um, I do believe that access to remedy is 
in some ways uh, red line when we're talking about the business and human rights issues. Uh, firstly, it's uh, very important for business itself uh, as it helps to uh, understand the, to create the uh, legal certainty for business. And also it's very important for victims uh, as uh, if you suffer from business, you always ha you always need to have a way to uh, to speak about your rights and to defend that. So, uh, recalling the um, last year Business and Human Rights uh, Forum on Business and Human Rights in Geneva, I remember when Professor Shure De Deva said, "Rights without effective remedies are not uh, really rights," and this idea catched me and I thought it would be very nice to go deeper to this, uh, to this uh, issue. So I will not go through all the aspects which I mentioned in slides because I do believe most of you know uh, about the uh, both positive and negative impacts uh, that uh, business can do for in the area of human rights it might be positive and negative. Uh, I, uh, but uh, there are a few things that uh, probably uh, should be mentioned. Uh, firstly, when we talk about the business and human rights area, we going back to 1970s, uh, and it was probably one of the turning points in the area of business and human rights. And from that moment, we started to discuss uh, uh, how we uh, can make a better uh, access to remedy, better accountability for, for uh, international uh, transnational uh, corporations, etc. Uh, and there were a few uh, initiatives. Uh, I'm mentioning only a few of them. It's draft code on transnational corporation, draft norms on business and human rights. So they are in red, they, they were not uh, accepted. Uh, there are a few existing initiatives. It's UN Global Compact, UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, so OECD. Uh, guidelines on multinational corporations, those are existing for, uh, mechanisms, uh, but um, still have their process and concerns. And also I mm, showed in the yellow light business and, human uh, business and Human Rights Treaty and put the question mark uh, in the end because it's still quite unclear if this uh, legal document could be accepted uh, because it still have many Many, uh, many problems with uh, current drafting. So uh, when we talk about business and human rights area, we always raise one uh, main problem, it's accountability uh, again, because there is an existing accountability gap. Uh, the human rights uh, obligations for, company, for companies usually are unclear uh, and risks a certain lack of transparency. When we talk about the victims, we always uh, raise the difficulty with access to remedies. And uh, more, uh, more or less, uh, scholars agree that there is no international mechanism. Yes, we have uh, some regional conventions, uh, some cases, either in national law, law or in the regional uh, human rights institutions. However, it's not, uh, it's not enough. And one of the, uh, on, uh, one of the solutions uh, when we try to narrow that accountability gap, we have to talk about the access to remedy. I will not cover all the, all, all the ways how can access to remedy work. It might be non-state based or state based mechanisms, uh, some of them non-judicial, judicial, but um, uh, when we, uh, the access to remedy mostly was covered in the uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And they tried to look uh, systematically to this issue. And the, uh, the third part of the, the third pillar of uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights uh, focused on uh, victims and uh, access to the effective remedy. The problem is that uh, UN guiding principles on business and human rights are still a uh, voluntary uh, document. Uh, countries, some of them are implementing uh, measures through the national action plans, uh, both uh, uh, data and uh, uh, Lerner mentioned a uh, few, few aspects. But uh, 
the problem with national action plans is still uh, the same, that they are not itself a very effective document. It might be short, it might be lengthy, but not, of, not all of them are discussing the questions uh, directly to, related to business and human rights issues. But mostly, uh, mention, usually, it, uh, national action plans mentions already existing uh, existing measures. So, uh, in some ways, uh, the business and human rights uh, treaty should uh, uh, answer how the uh, access uh, how could work the access to remedy. And when we look back to the zero draft on business and human rights treaty, it was uh, published in two thousand eighteen. Uh, there is not that much. Uh, uh, there is, uh, they do not much. They do not uh, speak enough about the access remedy. Uh, if you look to the to the pur uh, purpose of the treaty, they are saying that uh, Article Two is to strengthen the respect, promotion, and protection and fulfillment of human rights, and to ensure effective access to justice and remedy to victims of human rights violations in the context of transnational business activities and to advance international cooperation to, in, in this regard. If we go deeper to, uh, to this uh, convention, to this draft of the convention, uh, access remedy is not mentioned directly, there is not no article there. But uh, in the article four, which uh, talks about the victims and article eight, it is just said that uh, uh, right to uh, that every uh, victim has a right to fair, effective, uh, and prompt access to justice and remedies in accordance with international law, including restitution and uh, compensation, rehabilitation and repetition, as well as environmental remediation and ecological uh, restoration. But still, uh, there does exist a problem that uh, Zero Draft recognizes that corporate impu uh, impunity for human rights abuses are globally widespread. Uh, so why then there is no provision for an international mechanism for the remedy? Uh, if we look uh, further, because uh, the uh, treaty creation is still an, uh, an ongoing issue, we see that in the wise draft on business and human rights treaty, there are a few uh, steps further uh, to making the more clear uh, provisions in various areas uh, uh, of this treaty, of this uh, draft treaty. However, there is uh, still the problem with the notion of access to remedy. So if we look to, uh, again to article two, it's mostly the same as in the first draft. And if we look specifically, uh, what are the rights of, of uh, victims? Uh, again, uh, the treaty reaffirms the right of victims to be treated with the respect for their dignity and human rights, uh, the right to life, personal integrity, etc., etc. And uh, they mention that the right uh, to fair, effective, prompt, and non-discriminatory access to justice and adequate, effective, and prompt remedies. Uh, however, it, not, it does not go to the details. How could the mechanism uh, could look like? And again, there is no, uh, they do not, they rely only on the state level implementation uh, as a mechanism for remedy, but not for an international uh, remedial, remedial mechanism. And the second revised draft, which, is, uh, which was, uh, presented uh, uh, last month uh, in, uh, on August. Uh, the provisions are getting more clear and we can now see at least the idea how the uh, access to remedy could look like in the, uh, in the treaty if it will be accepted. Uh, firstly, access to remedy is mentioned in the purpose uh, that uh, it, might, it should be ensured access to justice and effective remedy for victims. And also, uh, if we look to that specific article, uh, so the, uh, the draft convention already has the article uh, focused uh, to access the remedy. So still, uh, it mentions that uh, state shall uh, provide adequate and effective legal assistance to victims, uh, including uh, by 
making information av uh, available for victims on their rights, on the status of the claims, uh, or providing assistance to initiative, initiate proceedings uh, in the courts of, uh, of another state party in appropriate cases, ensuring that rules uh, concerning the location of legal costs do not uh, place an unfair and reasonable burden of, of victims, uh, and etc. However, uh, the draft uh, lacks uh, a few things. It, it lacks remedies that have a, a preventive dimension. And also it fails to stipulate victims' right to reparations and to precautionary measures. And uh, uh, the, when we talk about the access to remedies, uh, we still have an open question about the possible solutions. Solutions. It might go through mandatory due diligence and national contact points. Maybe it would be uh, presented in the in the in the draft treaty, or maybe other. Uh, other mechan uh, mechanisms. So, as I'm still go, uh, uh, continuing this uh, this uh, research, I would be very thankful if you have any questions and we could discuss this uh, this uh, uh, issue further. So, I want just to leave more more time for uh, discussion. So, from my side, uh, that's it. If you want to contact me, feel uh, feel free to do that. Дякую, Матуша. Якщо можна, я одне питання зараз задам, і, можливо, в нас потім ще буде час для загальної дискусії. Скажіть, будь ласка, щодо вашого ставлення до можливих шляхів вирішення проблеми, що у жертв порушення прав людини з боку бізнесу, як правило, набагато менше фінансових да, інструментів для того, щоб звернутися за юридичною допомогою, професійною, щоб сплачувати різні обов'язкові платежі, у тому числі судові збори. І як одна з пропозицій була взагалі створення певного такого фонду державами, особливо для жертв жертв порушень у нерозвинутих країнах. Як ви ставитесь, тому що такий бар'єр фінансовий, матеріальний у доступі до правосуддя, він може бути суттєвим? Олена, можете бути так хорошим, щоб сказати знову вашу питання в англійській? Тому що здається, що я втратив кількість разів і не зрозумів вашу питання правильно. Unfortunately, we will have technical problems because uh, we have Ukrainian language in the audience. I will write to the chat, okay? Um, Наразі я зараз передам слово пані Юлії Розмітевої, а щодо питань до пана Арнаса ми ще повернемося. І Юля займається дуже актуальною проблематикою щодо бізнесу і прав людини в цифрову еру. І, власне, її презентація буде стосуватися саме оцих актуальних питань. Дякую, пані Олена. Можу я попросити вімкнути презентацію, поширити її? І я буду виступати англійською, тому прошу в аудиторію не включати тут, не в онлайн, український переклад, будь ласка. Дякую. Окей. Today we live in global digital and high level. Once again, okay. Uh, today we live in a global, digital and highly interconnected world, as the COVID-19 pandemic has reminded uh, us once again. And our digital era has several distinctive characteristics, namely a significant part of all actors' activities takes place in cyberspace or has an online component. Digital tools are extremely common in both public and private life. Data is key to any economic, social, political activity. The amount of data and the speed of their spread is incredibly high. And the development of communities is uneven, and the digital divide is widening in all its dimensions. 
Given these features, I would like to invite you to look at the global perspective and its reflection in the Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the first thing I'd like to draw attention to is the asymmetry of power in the digital age. My presentation doesn't work. Can I uh, ask you? Можно на ступне слайд, будь ласка. Okay, the first thing I'd like to draw attention to is the asymmetry of power in the digital age. Many companies, especially transnational corporations, have become more powerful and less controlled in recent years. Companies owning popular digital tools, software, social networks, search engines, applications have gained an enormous impact over all of us. The most important values such as human rights, the rule of law, justice, equality and democracy are under attack today due to the uncontrolled business activities. In the Central and Eastern Europe, in addition, these values have not established yet and are therefore not widely supported. This asymmetry of power is reflected in the asymmetry seen in democratic communities. We can still see people from the street rocketing to become opinion leaders without any institutional support. However, such people are less and less unbiased since giant corporations are using them as tools to channel public opinion. Some corporations are starting to equal small countries in how much power they have. This represents a grave problem, particularly for Central and Eastern Europe, as many countries in the region are characterized by the weakness of democratic institutions and the prolonged influence of uh, authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. The second important point is the deepening of the digital divide, which follows directly from the asymmetry of power. Business activities can affect all dimensions of this gap, gender, economic, educational, etc. Over 65% of people use digital technologies these days. Most of them hardly understand how digital technologies actually work. Others don't use them at all, thus lagging behind the modern world. With the gender aspect of the digital divide, we see that the representation of women in the private sector is still much lower than in public one. There are even fewer women, uh, women among the top management of uh, companies and in parliaments and governments. At the same time, the representation of women in the field of digital technologies is low all over the world. That said, AI algorithms are being implemented in all spheres of life right now, which means an even lower degree of representation of women. This can lead to our interest in not being taken into account and not represent in new digital solutions. Many countries in Central and Eastern Europe suffer from both the global digital divide and the presence of all three waves of the digital divide in accessing, using and benefiting from technology. The third aspect of the global perspective is that data, trust and attention are becoming new and key economic resources for businesses. In the world where we have been facing unresolved company responsibility issues since the 1970s, since the Shell and Togoni case, new challenges are coming up. Recently, warnings about the uncontrolled use of data as a resource as the weakness of the law regulating them have been particularly, particularly loud. Uh, some important steps have already been taken, especially in the uh, US and the European Union jurisdiction, as to trust and attention, which are abused and manipulated by companies. So far, there have been only a few concerned voices. The perception of digital space as free and self-regulating on the one hand, and the illusion of control over our devices, programs, and data on the other, gives the false illusion of control over what is happening so that numerous manipulations sleep uh, our attention. This is particularly important for Central and Eastern Europe, as their legal regulation and legal practices are even less in line with changes in the digital age. Gaps in regulation are filled by corporate policies, which are not based on fundamental principles of law. At the same time, contradictions in law, as well as the lack of rule of law, 
open up a wide field for abuse by companies. This is aggravated by the fact that the general public don't even expect businesses to behave responsibility here. The fourth issue uh, is the uncertainty of the consequences of business activity. What business is doing today has future consequences which are hard to predict. Many companies don't just use digital technology, but literally build their success upon them. This leads to an algorithmic discrimination which increases inequality or polarization of opinions and tailored the weakening of democratic institutions. What is important in digital age is that the consequences can be global, so all countries and regions will be inflicted. Among the main risks and negative trends, I would stress the following. The risk of human rights, uh, and um, human rights suffer from both direct violations and more subtle, uh, less obvious attack. The risk to hidden discrimination, um, it connected primarily with uh, solutions based on AI. The risk for autonomy. Um, autonomy suffers from subtle influences and gross manipulations by businesses today. The risk of silence in voices, um, because um, we know many facts uh, when business sell technologies to authoritarian governments, and the risk of uh, polarization and radicalization of opinions. Uh, it connected primarily with filter bubbles and these bubbles can be adjusted by businesses or um, those who buy technology and data without us being aware of it. Against this background, it is becoming increasingly clear that business needs to be more responsible without limiting their understanding of responsibility by purely business considerations, as is often the case in South Central and Eastern Europe. This brings us to the fifth aspect, the search for new stricter mechanism of liability and imposing more serious obligation in terms of, or in terms of human rights. In the first place, we need to determine the degree of responsibility that correlates with the harm done and takes into account whether it was direct or indirect, overt or covered. Secondly, we have to define the limits of responsibility. To what extent must campaigns campaign be held responsible for what happens at each stage of supply chains? Is a retail shop in Milan responsible for minuscule wakes of Bangladeshi tailor? Thirdly, we need to sort out the jurisdictional issues, which can't be done by simply imposing responsibility upon mother companies, namely because both the provision of justice and the payment of compensation will fall on development countries. In Central and Eastern Europe, this is complicated by gaps in national legislation, the absence of uh, national action plans, and the low level of UN guiding principles uh, on business and human rights implementation. The last but not least, the picture I have painted looks rather pessimistic. At the same time, business definitely can contribute to best practices and promote respect for human rights, justice and non-discrimination. The joint effort of all parties, governments, businesses, civil society, scientific community will facilitate the implementations of human rights center approach. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I will glad to discuss. Thank you very much, Julia. And uh, yes, we um, have the opportunity to return uh, to the question to Mr. Arnas. Uh, and my question uh, was uh, about uh, financial uh, barriers for victims of business-related abuses, uh, um, business barriers to access uh, to remedies to protect human rights. Uh, will uh, the option uh, to who found the special funding for such victims uh, which was proposed uh, work. Um, what do you think, Arnas, if um, such special funding for these victims uh, to overlap such obstacles for them uh, will be created? 
I don't, okay, we, we have not um, connection with Arnas at this moment, unfortunately. Um, if, uh, if participants uh, don't have uh, uh, any question uh, at this moment, uh, I would like uh, to give the floor to Alexei Sinyavsky, uh, who represents uh, represent our region as well. Um, and uh, we have a great opportunity today uh, uh, to have uh, uh, him as an extra bonus speaker. <laughs> Thank you very much, Elona. I'm sorry if I heard very bad. Uh, I can't make a, a better sounds of, of me. Everything uh, okay, thank you. It's okay? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, dear participants. Uh, I, I want to thank all the participants who presented their uh, topics today. They're very interested and very actual right now. And um, right now I want to move to my presentation and uh, where I would like to highlight potential business and human rights research related to the global COVID-19 pandemic. The global health and economic crisis caused by the spread of COVID-19 have become one of the cause of many economic, political, social, and the legal problems. The international business and human rights agenda have become one of the central limbs most affected by the new coronavirus infection. The virus has disrupted supply chains, exaggerated the already precocious situation of migrant workers and other vulnerable groups and led to a general decline in domestic and international business. As a result of difficult economic and social conditions, millions of workers around the world may uh, have already lose, lost their jobs, money, food, housing, and many of them lack of effective social protection for their human rights, as well as the access of, to effective remedies. A new challenge facing business enterprises is the need, opportunity, and desire to ensure the respect for all internationally recognized human rights as established in international business and human rights law. Uh, what are the human rights obligations of enterprises? What measures can they apply within the available resources to secure them? What is the responsible business conduct approach during the coronavirus of business enterprises? These are the main questions I will try to observe in my presentation. In 2020, the coronavirus spread uh, created a new problems for businesses, but also exaggerated existing ones, which have become the challenges for all entities involved in business activity. Due to the current spread of coronavirus, the activities of many enterprises were closed after the introduction of various restrictive measures in states around the world. Among all market segments, manufacturing, tourism, and hospitality were the hardest hit in, in Russia. The closure of global travel and hospitality companies is affecting small and especially medium-sized businesses around the world. In particular, based on the analysis of the data from 60, uh, 600,000 online cash registers about it throughout the Russia, the operator of online cash uh, lost may more than a half of their uh, value in the same period in 2019. The world hit were the fitness centers, uh, who lost their revenues fell by 90%. The clothing stores, uh, revenue fell by 88%. Footwear, 87%. Travel agencies, 89%. Mining hotels, 72%. And other segments. According to International Economic Forum, such changes are most affecting people working in a free wage economy. The self-employed, as well as those who now work in less paid jobs or work in part-time. Russia is no exception, and as a result of the global pandemic, many millions of people employed in the informal sectors have lost their jobs and received no meaningful compensation. The restrictions imposed by states have had the most severe impact on business workers, significantly limiting their human rights. In addition, the restrictions not only stopped the uninterrupted production of goods and services, but also created difficulties associated with their movement across the territory of states. In the current environment, it is well, especially important for business to develop a clear understanding of how to do business responsibly, both during and after the coronavirus crisis. In fact, the crisis posed a challenge for enterprises to quickly adapt 
to rapidly changing condition. Otherwise, the consequences may be very unfavorable. How often the representative of business community like to say change or die? With the aim of protecting human rights, adoption the con current condition involves focusing the attention of enterprises on international legal standards for protection of human rights. These are fundamental international standards, includes uh, United Nations Global Compact, OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, guidelines for the diligence for responsible business conduct, Party Declaration of Principles Concerning Multinational Enterprises and Social Policy, and the famous United Nations Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. All of the above standards contain practical recommendations to the observance and respect of internationally recognized human rights for small, medium, and large commercial enterprises, including the transnational and multinational corporations. Of course, the leading role among all standards should be given to the guidelines. Due to their universal acceptance, the most global comp impact on the current processes of dissemination, the protect, respect, and remedy framework. The restriction, restructuring of companies and value chains to address the crisis and decrease the role of governments in shaping the economy for the coming years opens the new opportunities to focus on commitments on responsible business conduct and to further integrate business and human rights standards and tools in the company's operations. This approach can be based on various international business and human rights standards and include mandatory measures to identify and assess potential adverse human rights impacts through human rights due diligence in particular. It will strengthen the social and economic well-being of workers of enterprises and will also help companies uh, come with uh, both current and future uh, disruptions in their supply chains. In turn, this will empower companies to access the private and public finance in uh, certain states. Critical in implementation of business and human rights standards among Western and Eastern companies is the human rights due diligence, which is in accordance with the guidance refers to the steps a company must take to understand, prevent, and remedy the negative consequences of its activities relation to human rights. The success of this procedure implementation allegedly depends on the state reg registration of the diligence laws. Thanks to the efforts of the European Union and Council of Europe, uh, a lot of them uh, were already implemented in uh, European states. Uh, I will just uh, mention the presentation of Beata Francic, which has already mentioned all of these uh, modern standards to diligence laws like uh, United Kingdom Modern Slavery Act and many others. Uh, unfortunately, in the countries of Eastern Europe, the understanding of the need to adoption for these laws is too poorly developed and the desire for their adoption should become one of the main national priorities of the states in future decade. If we are talking about the legal consolidation of norms for the protection of human rights from the impacts of business activities. Due to the fact that business enterprises are in extremely difficult financial situations because of the coronavirus pandemic, it becomes obvious that within the existing resources, it is almost impossible to ensure the full realizations of absolutely all human rights as declared in the United Nations Guiding Principles. Then the question arises, uh, are there any priorities for enterprises in ensuring the human rights in the context of coronavirus pandemic? The Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights has tried to answer this question, which has published the guidance on combating uh, coronavirus 19. It briefly outlines the priorities for the observance of economic, social, cultural, civil, and political human rights on various United Nations agendas. The guide provides the following qualifications for business and human rights agenda. All businesses have the personal responsibility to uphold human rights in accordance with United Nations guiding principles. Even in difficult economic situation and in times of public health crisis, as well as regardless of how governments fulfill their obligations, uh, the government measures to mitigate the economic impact in the form of economic assistance, incentive programs, or targeted interventions to benefit business should impose a duty on the beneficiary company to follow the United Nations principles on business and human rights. At the heart of the government measures to support companies in times of crisis should be the protection of workers, especially those who are in difficult situations. The recommendation observing and ensuring human rights during pandemic were also published by the framework United Nations Global Compact. Specifically, the Global Compact is calling business leaders around the world to unite the support, the workers, communities, and companies affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Business should ensure that any COVID-19 response is accessible to all people without discrimination based on race, color, 
disability, age, gender, religion, political or other opinion. Based on the above, several conclusions can be drawn. The first is responsible business conduct involves integrating human rights policies and procedures at all levels of the enterprises through human rights due diligence. The second, all commercial enterprises are independently responsible for the respect of human rights during the coronavirus pandemic, regardless of their size, sector, location, form of ownership or structure, as well as regardless of how states in which business activities are carried out fulfill their own obligations. And the third one is in the context of current crisis, the enterprises should pay special attention to ensuring the following internationally recognized rights. The rights to life, the children rights, the rights to work, right to prohibition of discrimination, right of everyone to enjoyment of just and favorable conditions of work, the right of social security, the right to an adequate standard of living, including adequate food, clothing and housing, right to everyone of everyone to enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. Additionally, companies should respect the rights of women and avoid any potential or actual adverse impacts on the rights of persons with disabilities, aged people, social minorities, and avoid their stigmatization in and outside the workplace. For the future challenges which may face the business, I will mention only two for the beginning. The first one is to raise the awareness of business and human rights principles and doctrine among the business, academia, lawyers, judges, human rights defenders, and private law practitioners. Any further steps to improve the legal and non-legal climate in the field of business and human rights are impossible without a basic understanding of the context and existing problems. I feel that across regional cooperation, which is represented by this forum, is a good opportunity to share the knowledge and good practices among the states and universities and non-governmental organizations. The second challenge is uh, addressed to business and human rights academics in both Western and Eastern Europe. The academics should focus more on practical research, which is especially important for understanding how the aforementioned problems are being solved out by European business by Eastern business and what obstacles government face in solving them and how business can contribute to solving them from their side. At the moment, the theoretical base concerning business and human rights has already been significantly developed by European states. And the only problem remain is the dissemination of this knowledge between the Eastern states. Thanks for your attention, that's all. Дякую, дякую дуже пане Олексію. І я хочу сказати, що пан Олексій представляє Казанський університет, Російська Федерація. І, власне, ми з ним так зв'язалися буквально вчора ввечері. І насправді я вважаю, що це дійсно чудова можливість, що форум став таким майданчиком, коли ми розширюємо наші зв'язки і є представники різних країн, з якими можна обговорювати ситуацію в наших країнах щодо забезпечення прав людини у сфері бізнесу. І до нас зміг повернутися, через технічні причини був відсутній зв'язок з паном Арнасом, і зараз я хочу знову повернути слово йому для того, щоб він мав можливість відповісти на питання щодо свого ставлення пропозиції, які лунали з приводу створення отакого спеціального фонду, який би фінансував можливість доступу до засобів правового захисту для жертв порушень з боку бізнесу. В такий спосіб, як би усувати нерівність у засобах, бо бізнес, як правило, має набагато більше бізнесу вагомі засоби фінансові для того, щоб вести певні спори і так далі. Дякую за питання, Олена. І, знову ж таки, я дуже сміхаю за технічні проблеми. Я просто втратила інтернет-конексію. Це вийшло з моєї сторони. І це дуже добре питання. І для багато часу це було вирішено від різних НГО, коли тільки процеси бізнесу і хуманітарії вирішили на ЮН рівні. 
how we will help the victims who suffered from the business. Because usually business is on that side which is stronger. They have the better lawyers, they have the, uh, better accessibility, uh, better financial means. And it was thought that it would be a very good idea that uh, uh, there would be a certain fund, uh, international fund, that, sh that could help the affected communities or victims um, to defend their, uh, their rights uh, uh, with, a, help, with a, a certain financial help. So uh, finally, in this uh, draft, we have a provision that uh, it could be established an international fund. Uh, it, it's, it, it says that uh, uh, the fund will be created after the, the, con uh, the convention would enter uh, into force. So it's, uh, it's not yet decided when exactly it could, could come. I would take a few years or more. Uh, so that's a that's very good mean. Uh, however, um, uh, the problem is that uh, uh, with the convention itself, it still has a lot of opposition towards the, the norms, towards the, uh, the idea. Uh, and uh, it's not sure because the, the, the current uh, example of, of, uh, of draft treaty uh, does not quite how the, uh, the fund will work. Definitely it should be come from the, uh, probably states would have to, to, to put their input and it's not sure if the countries will support this, uh, this, um, this norm. But the idea of the international fund would, would be very, uh, very good and uh, it would help to make the uh, remedies more effective. Дуже, дуже дякую. І в мене питання, власне, до всіх панелістів нашого круглого столу. От як дослідники, які а, живуть, працюють, займаються цією проблематикою в Східній, Центральній Європі, а, як ви вважаєте, от мене найбільше непокоїть, які засоби впливу у Східній, в Центральній Європі можуть використовуватися на бізнес? От якщо держава, наприклад, не спрацює, давайте за душки винесемо державу, державу, наприклад, вона ну, обмежується таким поміркованим, стриманим підходом в сфері бізнесу і прав людини, не приймає чи приймає, але лишає формально, суто як формальний текст, національні плани дії і так далі. Які інші важелі впливу можуть спрацьовувати у Східній і Центральній Європі, якщо, як ми сьогодні чули, громадянське суспільство або зосереджує свою увагу на діях держави або є слабким, верховенство права є низьким, корупція є високою. Якось, може, це буде дуже песимістично на цьому завершувати наш круглий стіл. Тому давайте подумаємо, які інші важелі впливу можуть спрацьовувати. Будь ласка, Юля. Дякую, пані Олена. Це дуже хороше питання. І я думаю, що одним з важелів впливу може бути соціальна репутація бізнесу. Насправді, в довгостроковій перспективі бізнес має бути зацікавлений у правах людини, тим більше, ну, я знову в цифрову епоху, так? оскільки зараз панує така модель ірраціональної поведінки споживача, вона не є нескінченою. Тобто втома від цієї моделі наростає, а навпаки оця довіра до бізнесу, це такий може бути ну, серйозний соціальний капітал, просто вигідний самому бізнесу. Це може бути одним з важливих. Дякую дуже. Які ще, можливо, інші бята? Єкатерина? Я думаю, що в якійсь мірі, але, звісно, це треба часу, і це не щось, що ми працюємо для всіх бізнесів. Але ми можемо бачити, що є якісь добре справи, що є якісь дуже добре працівники, які залишаються спеціальні компанії, they're just running very unsustainable business models. And uh, for example, I've just recently heard about a very, like really brilliant um, person working for one of the Polish companies 
which has quite a broad global presence, who, who is leaving simply because, you know, we are kind of putting a lot of um, hopes in the consumers, but particularly now with COVID and people's incomes dwindling, people are looking for to buy kind of the cheapest products. And, you know, you, know, you, can, you cannot blame them for that, right? I mean, the problem starts when they want to buy like six new t-shirts instead of one good one. And this is what we are still seeing, right? It's not, it's kind of still the same amount of funds sometimes being spent by the same person, but, you know, on things that are not produced in a human rights compliant way. And what, simply because the business obviously follows consumers, then this person kind of at this moment just said, okay, I'm, I'm not fine with that. What I'm trying to do in my work is to help this company to be more sustainable and respect human rights more. And I see what are the other drivers and I, I see that I don't get anywhere with that or not as far as I would want. So I'm quitting. I'm quitting and I'm moving to another company whose business model is actually oriented to, to be really sustainable. And... Um, and I think we'll see this kind of also transfers of talent between the companies. Uh, but it also kind of takes maturity also among the employees and kind of broader society. Um, what I found kind of, you know, um, to be fair, the situation is very negative and pessimistic for a degree in Poland as well. Uh, but still, uh, where I see the kind of the flashes of light and hope, are as a collaborative platform. So I see how collaborative and kind of, um, in a way positive, obviously within certain limits, but still kind of um, forthcoming business can be if you really engage in discussion, which tries to understand the, the problem behind why they actually object certain regulations and provisions. So as mentioned, I'll be talking about it more tomorrow, but basically we worked on labor, um, on the prevention of forced labor, and so a number of issues in the Polish legislation that needs to be changed, but having kind of the trust-based relationship with participants with, um, of the discussion is crucial because it gives you space and time to actually express your arguments and tell what are your concerns. What we are lacking in the public sphere in Poland, but also in some other countries, is actually this trust and willingness to listen to each other. You kind of have more of the monologues, both on the political scene, but also when it comes to economic kind of level, you kind of have more monologues from different sides. So you've got a conference and everybody just comes and says what they think about specific, let's say, legal issue, kind of, let's say, how to solve uh, outsourcing. But we need more spaces where you can actually discuss how to solve this problem and not just describe what this problem is from different angles. And so it's multi-stakeholder, Kind of, uh, kind of platforms and groupings and working groups that kind of last over a certain time. It's not something that you will build in one month. It's something like, it took us like two years almost to develop <laughs> the toolkit, but you kind of now everybody wants to kind of promote it. Everybody wants to kind of, you know, is behind it. And we've got like labor inspection, different ministries, business and so on. And I think this is the achievement. And I think we just need more platforms. So I would suggest, trying to reach out beyond our usual bubbles, also in terms of civil society, trying to reach out and, you know, both the business and um, say administration and kind of try to look what are the genuine concerns. And by far, I'm not saying that we won't have business which will just kind of push for its own kind of financial interests. Um, but I think it's important to try to see more of the nuances of, on all the sides and try to engage with those who are more um, reasonable and kind of open to discussion and open to changing, but just kind of concerns about how they will survive in the new um, change environment. So I think it's important to really kind of try to see the nuances and identify those actors with whom you can talk and move things forward. Thanks.
Дуже дякую, пані Бята. І от, до речі, в чат зараз можуть бачити тільки панелісти, тому я для всіх учасників скажу, що якраз пані Лілія Олійник цитує пані Катерину щодо бізнесу «Права людини треба продати», тому продовження цієї думки «Дотримання прав людини має бути вигідним в економічному, соціальному, репутаційному плані. Це фактично створення нової культури, де порушення прав людини зі сторони бізнесу стає чимось за межами норми. І я хочу зараз дати слово пані Єкатерині і відразу, перш ніж навіть пані Єкатерина висловиться, я хочу, щоб була можливість у пана Віктора поставити питання пані Єкатерині, тому що от один з учасників це доцент кафедри теорії права, консультант Верховного суду, друг Конституці... суддів Конституційного суду, Пан Віктор, будь ласка, вам слово. Добрий день. Дуже приємно було услышати ваше інтересне ваше виступлення. Було дуже... у, всіх, у всіх, кого я бачу зараз да, на екрані, було дуже, дуже інтересне виступлення. Но у мене питання до нашої вот, колеги з Республіки Білорусь. Мені вот якось цікаво, цікаво ви там написали, що вот, в зв'язку з цими вот, ну, відомими событиями, там, пост поствыборными mm -hmm. у вас э, произошло какое-то сразу там сдвиг, сдвиг понимания, в том числе бизнес понял там вот что важности и он почувствовал монетизацию mm -hmm. там, там отношения к людям. Yeah. Мне не совсем, mm -hmm. честно говоря, поня... это первый вопрос, который у меня будет. Мне не совсем понятно, как за такой короткий время, за такой короткий период и на каких именно примерах. Вы там обещали mm -hmm. какие-то примеры, там, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Вот хотя бы какой-то один, из которого можно было увидеть, что вот именно за эти два месяца, допустим, бизнес почувствовал действительно выгоду и там уважение, уважение к людям, монетизацию, как вы говорите. И второй вопрос по поводу вот этих списков, э, uh -huh. таких, которые там списки там лояльных э, предприятий, которые лояльно относятся к власти и нарушают там права человека. Я так понимаю, что это ж разные. Мы, вполне же возможно, что есть предприятия, которые лояльно относятся к там, ну, к условно говоря, действующей власти и при, этом нарушают, и при этом не нарушают прав человека. А есть, наверное, предприятия, которые активно поддерживают, там, ну, скажем так, оппозицию. Не знаю, как там у вас это, ну, как называется этот ну, термин, у вас более применимо. Ну, вы понимаете, о чем идет. Да, да, да. Более mm -hmm. поддерживают, там, ну, скажем так, восставший народ и оппозицию, но при этом вовсю нарушают права человека. Потому что mm -hmm. у нас же было именно так. У нас и в четвертом mm -hmm. году, вы помните, и в в 2014-м было полно таких случаев, когда там поддерживали там и Майданы, поддерживали фирмы, которые, честно говоря, к правам, на, которым на права человека, и в том числе права своих работников и потребителей было при этом совершенно плевать. И в то же время были какие-то предприятия, некоторые я даже знаю, которые там поддерживали авторитарные, там бывшие авторитарные пророссийские режимы, и тем не менее и с зарплатами, и с, уровнем, и с уровнем зарплат, и с уровнем там безопасности на производстве, и с уровнем качества продукции было все просто великолепно. Ну, тоже так. Вот как вы вот эти списки, как они эти списки, по какому принципу все-таки формировались? Либо это двое разных списка. Список тех, которые поддерживают права, под... которые там поддерживают права человека, и не, точнее, нарушают права человека, и отдельный список, которые там поддерживают действующую власть. Вот, вот мне вот эти два вопроса интересуют. Угу. Спасибо, спасибо. Если я, наверное, очень долго, много занял ваше время, но спасибо. Спасибо большое. Я отвечу с удовольствием. Пока я буду отвечать на первый вопрос, можно попросить Олену, если у нас есть время, включить мою презентацию на предпоследнем слайде, потому что это ответ как раз на второй ваш вопрос. Если это возможно, если нет, то бог с ним. А, относительно а, а, на предпоследнем. Угу. А, первый вопрос, который касается, как поняли, что значит, когда я говорила про монетизацию, что за такой короткий срок, вы знаете, вот это и нас удивляет. На самом деле просто вы не представляете вообще, что происходит зашло в обществе, тут как бы родилось новое общество, на самом деле. Я не знаю, видно ли вам оттуда да, это, но понятно, что нам это видно больше. А, пример приведу, значит, ну, смотрите, Основная сейчас как бы, проблема, в общем-то, 
для бизнеса, когда закончилась сама избирательная кампания и наступили мирные протесты, да, вот начались эти мирные протесты, основная проблема и в отношениях бизнес-работник, и в отношениях бизнес-клиент, и в отношениях бизнес-сообщества, просто люди, которые ходят да, по улице, там, вокруг там, ресторана, например, свелись к тому, что как, каким образом во время этих протестов ведет себя бизнес и люди. Потому что на самом деле абсолютно ну, чрезмерно применяется сила к мирным демонстрантам, и очень часто, это касается в частности ресторанного бизнеса, людям приходится спасаться в, в торговых центрах, в ресторанах, в кафе, ну вообще везде, где они, что они видят, да, вот, перед собой. И здесь очень важно, мы видим, например, такую тактику, некоторые торговые центры перед людьми, лицом людей просто закрывают дверь, просто как бы абсолютно показывая, что, знаете, это ваши проблемы, нам тут не надо вот этого ничего. И что некоторые же, наоборот, пускают людей, пускают для того, чтобы оказать первую помощь, либо просто пускают для того, чтобы людям как бы уберечь свою жизнь и здоровье. Да? И вот был такой пример, у нас есть маленькая кофейня, она называется «Аппетит», она в центре города, когда кофейня пустила людей, которые убегали от ОМОНа и закрыла дверь, чтобы невозможно было зайти туда силовикам, то есть она намеренно закрыла дверь, и э, силовики, в частности, начальник управления по борьбе с э, организованной преступностью и коррупцией, э, разбил битой эту дверь в эту кофейню для того, чтобы вытащить оттуда людей, за которыми он, ну, они гнались, да. Ну, а так как они ходят все сейчас у нас без формы, вообще без опознавательных знаков, а просто вот с битами и вот в балаклавах, это потом узнали, что это начальник, да, а так это просто вот люди в спортивных костюмах. В общем, он разбил эту дверь и э, достал все-таки этих, забрал людей, которых, э, которых они преследовали. Э, что происходит на следующий день? Следующие пять дней э, в эту кофейню стоит очередь, э, огромная очередь. Это очень маленькая кофейня, у них не было такой прибыли за всю их, наверное, историю существования. Э, нескончаемый поток людей на завтра, на послезавтра. То есть вот тот фактор, который я обозначала еще как третью причину, огромная гражданская эмпатия, да, люди э, увидели, что вы лояльны к нам, вы нас э, как бы захотели спасти и поддержать, и мы теперь поддержим вас. И кофейня окупила свою эту разбитую дверь, знаете, за, за день буквально. Соответственно, смотря на эти примеры, другие бизнесы эм, по начали понимать, что лояльность человеку и поддержка его в такой вот сложной ситуации, она на самом деле монетизируется очень быстро, потому что то же самое мы можем говорить и про работников, да, когда э, работодатель понимает, что там он делает твой рабочий график таким, чтобы тебе было удобно выйти на протест, да, чтобы там э, как бы не, как минимум не применяет к тебе никаких санкций, а еще как максимум делает это удобным для тебя. Безусловно, ты этому работодателю будешь намного больше э, лоялен и отдаваться и так далее. Но вот случай с кофейней аппетит, он был очень показательный. А, точно так же один ресторан известный сделал публичное заявление на YouTube со своей командой, разместил его, а, открыто заявив, что мы поддерживаем, а, мы против насилия, да, в первую очередь, и мы, безусловно, поддерживаем а, протесты и вообще а, народ. И в этот ресторан абсолютно повалила тоже куча людей. То есть люди сегодня выбирают потребителей, чисто с точки зрения экономической, сегодня у людей основной фактор выбора – это вот э, такая лояльность к человеку. Поэтому в этом контексте, конечно, не весь бизнес понял, да, далеко. Мы в начале пути, но просто сдвиг, понимаете, о чем я говорю, да? Произошел очевидный сдвиг. Этого не было зимой, этого не было еще весной. Вот. Э, бизнес абсолютно не понимал, какие такие экономические выгоды вообще могут быть от соблюдения прав человека. Что вы мне такое говорите? Мне вот главное, чтобы тут меня не трогали, чтобы, не дай бог, мне ничего там не разбили и не сломали, да? Вот. 
Теперь касательно вашего второго вопроса. Вы абсолютно правы, и вы, в общем-то, зрите в корень, в тот же корень, в который зрила я, когда готовила этот свой доклад, и вот сейчас работаем мы над этой темой. Конечно, поэтому я и отметила здесь три вот этих вот э, пункта, три вопросика, которые с точки зрения научной э, нуждаются в исследовании. Это методология составления этих списков, критерии, на основании которых бизнес попадает в эти списки, э, выявление нарушений и удаление из этих списков. Вы абсолютно правы на самом деле, что бизнес, который э, поддерживает ну, народ, да, скажем так, но ну, мы не можем называть это оппозицией, потому что это уже там чуть ли не 80% населения, то оппозиция это уже они, да, поддерживает движение, ну, скажем так, протестное. Э, э, бизнес на самом деле далеко не весь э, ведет себя со своими работниками приемлемо. И дискри дискриминация у нас на рынке труда очень большая в том числе, да, и частники считают, что мы можем, это госпредприятием там, да, что-то а, вливайте, а мы частники, мы делаем, что хотим. То есть здесь э, на самом деле это вот то, о чем я говорила. Точка входа, которую мы получили с этими событиями, она очень хорошая, но ее нельзя оставить на уровне эмоционального вот порыва поделить всех на чужих и своих, да, на врагов и на друзей, для того, чтобы это действительно работало и превратилось в устойчивую, системную э, практику, да, и механизм этот blaming and shaming, чтобы он работал, да, как бы на, на, обвиняю и стыжу, да, тот механизм, о которых руководящие принципы говорят, необходимо тщательно подходить к критериям попадания бизнеса в эти списки, к критериям его э, изымания из этих списков, да, когда он перестает. То есть ведь самая главная цель, коллеги, это ведь не наказать бизнес. Самая главная цель – это воздействовать на него для того, чтобы он понимал э, рамку поведения и, собственно говоря, в его же благо, ему же будет лучше самому от этого. Тут важно позитивное мышление и вообще позитивное правосознание. И в этом контексте вот хочу показать тоже вам. Мы вслед за руководством своим белорусским по бизнесу и правам человека, мы разработали вот такую, ну, аналитическую, как бы это, ну, такой брошюрка тоже, да, зачем бизнесу права человека выгоды для компании. Why do business need human rights benefits for company? Да? Вот. Она есть в электронном... Там по... мы описываем очень подробно все, что э, может касаться, э, как права человека могут влиять на развитие бизнеса, на его устойчивость, на его репутацию э, и в отношении отношений бизнес-клиент, бизнес-работник, бизнес-сообщество. Да? Она есть в электронном виде, и если интересно... Вам я э, сброшу ссылку в чат, либо, может быть, э, Оленя, да, чтобы она, ну, чтобы вы могли, вот, э, это в тему нашего вот вопроса, который Олена задавала последний сейчас. Вот. Спасибо, если я ответила на ваши вопросы. Спасибо, спасибо. Спасибо огромное. большое. Ну, да, но мы, конечно, очень надеемся, что и Екатерина, и Алексей, и Беата, и, и Арнас, и все панелисты сегодняшние смогут к нам приехать в следующем году, и мы соберемся и подискутируем. А, ну, до речи, еще до списков, я хочу сказать, что COVID-19, он еще такую практику, например, вив, у, у, есть инициатива, яка створила списки, как бы позитивные и негативные списки того, как великие транснациональные компании поводили себя у ланцюгах поставок. Да, ну, и это был такой инструмент впливу на эти транснациональные компании, но, мовно говоря, H&M, там, хвилюючись за свою репутацию, не хотела потрапити в список поганих замовников продукции у ланцюгах поставок, потому что, если бы там H&M відмовилася от від своих замовленных товаров, там одномоментно дуже и дуже багато людей втратили б свою работу в країнах Південної Азії и так далее. И тому насправді ця відповідальна поведінка бізнесу, від якого дуже часто залежать там тисячі життів людей, звичайно важлива і можливі дійсно і такі інструменти впливу, коли дійсно компанія боїться втратити 
імідж, якщо вона дорожить цим іміджем. На жаль, з українських реалій ми іноді бачимо, що компанії простіше закритися і відкритися під новою назвою, да? і зовсім не хвилюватися за свою репутацію. На жаль, такі практики також існують, але ті компанії, які переживають за свою репутацію і які розуміють, що це їх капітал, їх репутація, то, звичайно, ці інструменти впливу можуть спрацьовувати. І е, буквально завершуючи, е, ніяк ми да, не можемо розстатися, але я не можу надати слово пані е, Алевтині Савч, е, Санченко, е, з якою ми також дуже багато років е, власне, співпрацюємо з тематики бізнесу і прав людини в Україні. Вона, на жаль, сьогодні не може бути в Харкові, але вона в Києві і дуже хоче до нас звернутися, приєднатися до нашої дискусії і Буквально це три хвилини, і ми зробимо перерву на півгодини, трошки менше, ніж на півгодини, і повернемося у пів на п'яту для того, щоб обговорити чудову ідею, яка прийшла Даніелі Памплоне, яку ми сьогодні бачили, об'єднати жінок, які є експертками в сфері бізнесу і прав людини, але які працюють у так званих периферійних країнах. І ми на сьогодні об'єднали авторський колектив з зі Східної Європи, з Латинської Америки, з Африки і з Азії, для того, щоб спільно написати монографію з бізнесу і прав людини. Це буде о 16.30. А зараз, будь ласка, слово пані Алі. Пані Алло, не чуємо вас. Ви підключені як спікерка, але ми, на жаль, вас не чуємо. Можливо, ви тоді повернетесь до нас о 16.30. Я ще раз хочу анонсувати, що наші шановні експерти і експертки, багато з них доєднаються до нас завтра, коли ми будемо в рамках панельної дискусії обговорювати поточну ситуацію в наших країнах. Я ще раз хочу щиро подякувати за надзвичайно цікаві доповіді. Я думаю, що у всіх нас з'явилися такий матеріала для того, над чим подумати. Я перепитаю у наших спікерів і спікерок, чи можемо ми поділитися їх презентаціями, які становлять окремий да, інтерес. Ще раз дякую всім учасникам. Ми повернемося о 16.30. Зараз у нас пауза. Thank you for the very interesting session. I'm looking forward to the next ones. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you, Beata. Thank you very much.
У Національному юридичному університеті імені Ярослава Мудрого кінець вересня проходить надзвичайно насичено і продуктивно для всієї світової юридичної спільноти. Наш виш продемонстрував прагнення не просто відповідати викликам нового часу, а випереджати їх, залучивши передовий міжнародний досвід. Ця ідея втілилася у життя проведенням першого юридичного форуму. Після його завершення стало зрозуміло, 
У юристів України з'явився новий майданчик для спілкування з правовою елітою світу. Форум набув загальнодержавного значення. Він остаточно закріпив за собою статус планового щорічного заходу. Це дозволило відразу готуватися до наступного, ще масштабнішого правового дійства. І ось третій міжнародний юридичний форум звершився. Він став результатом партнерської роботи університету з ОБСЄ, фондом Конрада Аденауера, Радою Європи. Я пишаюсь тим, що якраз в Харкові створені такі умови, які дають можливість проводити перший поки що і єдиний правовий форум. Форумів багато відбувається різних, але всеосяжний форум – це Харківський міжнародний юридичний форум. Це дуже важлива подія, яка знаменує собою черговий крок на шляху досконалення тієї правової системи, яка сьогодні потрібна для нашої держави. Проведення міжнародного юридичного форуму саме в Національному юридичному університеті імені Ярослава Мудрого вже стало доброю традицією. Адже тут створені всі умови для того, щоб учасники та гості форуму могли милуватися краєвидами міста та ефективно вирішувати надважливі питання.
picture I see on the wall reminds me of your charming smile and every mistake I recall again makes me feel so
у Національному юридичному університеті імені Ярослава Мудрого кінець вересня проходить надзвичайно насичено і продуктивно для всієї світової юридичної спільноти. Наш виш продемонстрував прагнення не просто відповідати викликам нового часу, а випереджати їх, залучивши передовий міжнародний досвід. Ця ідея втілилася у життя проведенням першого юридичного форуму. Після його завершення стало зрозуміло, у юристів України з'явився новий майданчик для спілкування з правовою елітою світу. Форум набув загальнодержавного значення. Він остаточно закріпив за собою статус планового щорічного заходу. Це дозволило відразу готуватися до наступного, ще масштабнішого правового дійства. І ось третій міжнародний юридичний форум звершився. Він став результатом партнерської роботи університету з ОБСЄ, фондом Конрада Аденауера, Радою Європи. Я пишаюсь тим, що якраз в Харкові створені такі умови, які дають можливість проводити перший поки що і єдиний правовий форум. Форумів багато відбувається різних, але всеосяжний форум – це Харківський міжнародний юридичний форум. Це дуже важлива подія, яка знаменує собою чаровий крок – на шляху досконалення тієї правової системи, яка сьогодні потрібна для нашої держави. Проведення міжнародного юридичного форуму саме в Національному юридичному університеті імені Ярослава Мудрого вже стало доброю традицією. Адже тут створені всі умови для того, щоб учасники та гості форуму могли милуватися краєвидами міста та ефективно вирішувати надважливі питання.
Шановні колеги, ми продовжуємо нашу роботу. I hope that interpretation is working. Дякую. Так, і, власне, ми, да, ми продовжуємо нашу роботу, і зараз у нас за програмою презентація ідеї міжрегіональної монографії наукової праці «Бізнес і права людини. Не почуті жіночі голоси». Насправді, це робоча назва. І ідея, як я вже сказала, вона прийшла до Даніли Памплони, яка є співголосною головою Латиноамериканської регіональної асоціації з бізнесу і прав людини, професоркою Католицького, університет, Католицького університету Парани в Бразилії. І, і також можу ще також додати, що Даніела, а, ну, я її щиро заздрю в тому, що вона займається якраз PHD-програмою з бізнесу і прав людини. І якщо в нас буде трошки часу, ми навіть про це можемо з нею поговорити, який досвід і як і цього вдалося досягти, мати таку PHD-програму в своєму вузі. І, власне, до Даніли прийшла ця чудова ідея, і наразі вона зібрала попередній такий авторський колектив, і ця ідея, вона якраз обумовлена тим, що жінки стикаються з низкою бар'єрів в своєму академічному житті, і це Ну, власне, такий вихідна точка для обговорення сьогодні. Але, крім того, звичайно, ми можемо обговорити інші додаткові бар'єри, які мають в цьому сенсі універсальний вплив на представників академічного середовища. Це у тому числі і мовний бар'єр, тому що світове академічне середовище є переважно англомовним. І, звичайно, навіть якщо ви володієте англійською мовою на тому там, рівні, про який від нас нормативно вимагається бі або навіть вище, ви все рівно думаєте а, своєю рідною мовою, а це означає, все рівно маєте певний бар'єр, маєте перекладати свої думки, формулювати. А, і, крім того, це ще може бути такий бар'єр регіональний, а, якщо ви не є представником чи представницею да, країни, які мають мають лідируючі позиції на світовій арені в обговоренні тих чи інших питань, що стоять на порядку денному, в тому числі в сфері бізнесу і прав людини, то також ваш голос може бути непочутим. Ну, принаймні, вам складніше долучитися до міжнародних подій, якщо вони не відбуваються, наприклад, у вашій країні чи в вашому регіоні і так далі. Тому, насправді, дуже мені подобається, Подобається ідея такої спільної наукової праці, і я надзвичайно рада, що ми маємо сьогодні знову можливість почути пані Даніелу, і зараз я хочу передати їй слово, щоб вона дійсно розказала свій погляд і, можливо, досвід Латинської Америки щодо подолання бар'єрів, з якими стикаються жінки у науковій сфері. І, власне, її бачення, які тут можуть бути кроки для того, щоб такі бар'єри долати. Вітаю, Даніла. Hi, Елена. Thank you so much. First of all, I'd like to thank you for giving us the chance to discuss this project in such a great event. I am very honored to be um, in this, what I believe it is an all feminine panel. I don't know if someone has already came up with the idea of a panel, but here we are to present our project. This book that Olena was mentioning, written only by women scholars on the business and human rights field, which I have the honor to co-edit with Olena and also Carolina Olarte, who is here with us today. I hope we can discuss women's presence in academia and also to exchange some of the challenges that we face in Latin America and hopefully help to build bridges and solutions. 
I'm very honored to be in a panel with these distinguished colleagues who represent countries in different regions of the world. As Olena has mentioned, we will try to discuss the hurdles that women face in academy in general and on the business and human rights fields in particular. And I want to start with this to justify the idea of the book we want to present. In order to do that, I want to begin by sharing some data. The World Bank tells us that women are already more than half of the Latin America population. Despite that, we are only 30% in parliaments, 15% in cities administration, or 32% in Supreme Courts in the region. Enrollment, while well, turning to the ac ac academia, enrollment in Latin American universities is higher for women we represent 55% of the students. But leadership in public university remains in the hands of men. They are 72% of the leaders. Even though women occupy 46% of teaching positions, the highest echelons are mostly occupied by men. But it's very telling that 34 of the top 200 world universities according to the Times Higher Education Ranking of 2019, are led by women, and most of them in the United States, in England, but also in Germany, Australia, Canada, France, and Spain. Although my country, Brazil, presents the highest level in the region of articles published by women authors, there are still lots of room for improvement. When I thought about the need of a Latin American branch of the Global Business and Human Rights Scholars Association, I also thought that we needed to foster the women's roles in discussions about business and human rights. And I was very happy to see that, for instance, in our second regional conference that was held last week, women were responsible for more than half of the papers presented. Still, we need to acknowledge that there are huge hurdles. Some may also affect male representatives in this field, as it is the case of language, which is a barrier, not only because many of us do not speak English, but also because there is a peculiar way each culture will express its thinking. And it might be difficult for this particular way to meet the requirements built by another culture. So we need to be heard and read, but it is still the exception to find reviewers and editors that fully understand deep cultural differences among all of us. And then, of course, there is a gender challenge. Unfortunately, we still find academic events, for instance, that do not reflect concerns about gender balance regarding panelists, but do reflect, unfortunately, our patriarchal heritage from colonial times. Finally, all this combined represents a higher and thicker wall for women in peripheral countries to jump over. We share the gender and the diversity of mother languages which are other than English. And my guess is that you there face the same challenges, I mean, in Central and Eastern Europe. With all this in mind, we thought that we needed to open a venue for us to present our ideas. And this is actually how we came up with the idea of the book written only by women scholars on the business and human rights field and practitioners in the same field. Well, the idea is that we needed to have a um, tool to actually write and tell the world what is, it, what, what is it exactly that we are thinking and what is it exactly that we are researching. I always feel that whenever we are, wherever we are in our regions in the world, we are the ones who know better how to describe what are the challenges, what is really happening when we talk about the business impacts in our regions. We are the ones that should be presenting solutions and trying to tackle all the hurdles that those impacts impose in our people. So how come we're going to have the chance to tell the world what is it that we think about it all if we do not have the chance to write and to be read? 
And this is one of the things or probably the main thing that led us to this initiative. Well, um, I would love to know, I would love for you to know a bit more about the book. And this is why I'll stop now because I know that I will be followed by one of my co-editors, Carolina Larte, and she will be sharing more about the, the project. Thank you, Elena. Дякую, дякую дуже, Даніла. І а, я також хочу надати а, слово а, пані а, Кароліні Оларте, яка є директоркою департаменту філософії та історії права в університеті а, Жаберяна, Колумбія. І, а, власне, да, погодилася і підтримала а, цю ідею, виступає співредакторкою а, цієї книги, ну, яка планується до написання. І і е, з великим задоволенням надаю слово е, пані Кароліні для того, щоб вона також своїм поглядом, що її надихає і, власне, підштовхує е, доєднатися до цієї ініціативи, яка є великим викликом насправді. The, Daniela, thank you very much. And uh, I also want to thank Olena for organizing this great event and for building bridges between the regional associations working on business and the human rights. Um, together with Olena and Daniele, uh, we took on our hands the project of editing this book, which working title still is Women's in Business and Human Rights, Women's in BHR. Uh, we came up with the book idea in order to share light on this brilliant woman working in uh, our field. Uh, but um, it is important to say that we did not want this to be just a book known by the gender of the chapter's authors. We thought we could use the idea to actually build a sorority among these women. We really wanted this project to present them with the possibility of exchanging outside their regions, outside their own countries. Uh, the different chapters will not necessarily tackle women's hurdles in academy. On the contrary, they are the product of these women years of experience. Research and Still, the experience of being part of it should give us all the chances to women in the field from and living in the different countries in Asia, Latin America, Africa, and Central and Eastern e Europe. And the response was marvelous. We gather two authors from Asia, five authors from Africa, seven from Central and Eastern Europe, and 10 authors from uh, Latin America. Then uh, the city of themes and subjects covered on public corporate capital indigenous people's rights and of course uh, some chapters on uh, gender equality. Uh, so everyone got the chance to meet each other and understand what are their research is about and to expand uh, their network. We really believe that building this network is another way to empower women who are living and researching in areas that many, many would overlook. Uh, we also have deadlines to attend, but, uh, and this is very, very important, talking about women's work in these particular pandemic times. All deadlines were thought, bearing in mind the special situation that many of us women find ourselves during the pandemic. So plenty of room was given for these women to have proper time to deliver their works, because the last thing we wanted was 
to be the other layer of lives already uh, very, very burdened. So we expected to have a public round of discussions on the paper next semester and finally to publish the book before we see the end of 2021. Uh, and uh, we want to invite you from now on to participate actively in the different discussions will arise with the publication of the book and to apply for hopefully Я так розумію, що пропадає. Так, а яка мова? Ми тоді продовжимо, поки що, поки з'явиться знову зв'язок. Пані Кароліна, ви з нами? Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm really oh, okay, sorry. Okay. I'm experiencing okay, some wait. connection problems. Can you yeah. hear me? Uh, yes, 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 we are hearing you. I'm really sorry. Uh, uh, I will not I will not put my camera on, so maybe the connection will work a little bit, a little better. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I don't know at what point did the connection fell out. Uh, uh, we are going to publish uh, this book uh, by the end of uh, 2021. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we had a, a first meeting, a virtual meeting with... Um, with uh, Unfortunately, we lost connection. Daniela, чи можу я попросити вас продовжити, можливо, тому що, на жаль, дуже поганий зв'язок і учасники, учасниці не чують Кароліну, на жаль, про наші плани на роботу упродовж наступного року. Okay, yes, I just want to uh, go back. I think that one of the parts that we missed was when um, just right after Carolina was telling us of all these women that we get the response all over the world. And when she mentioned that we are actually trying to bring women from the peripheral uh, regions in the world. That's why we'll have Central and Eastern Europe, Asia, Latin America and Africa in this project. So the researches that we have already in the book, they are from, from different um, issues, um, such as public procurement, corporate capture, transparency and supply chains, child, uh, child's rights, indigenous women, human rights defenders, um, digital technologies, and as we could hear her saying, of course, we also have chapters on gender equality. So what we really wanted is to give these women the chance to connect, the chance to do some networking. This is why the way that we thought about doing this was actually having virtual meetings where we could meet. Um, of course, this is the way that everybody's doing things now with, the, with COVID but to actually really give a chance for these women to understand that in other parts of the world, we have the same hurdles, the same challenges. It's not easy for any of us. And also to give them the chance to see that their peers are actually um, developing researches on academic issues that they also uh, have interest on. So, as Carolina was saying, we do have um, um, deadlines to, to attend, but we've tried to make this um, as easy as it could.
could be for all the women involved, thinking that mostly now during the pandemic, we have so many other things, just layers of activities and of burdens on top of us. So we have lots of time to think about the project, to discuss among us, to build stronger um, papers, and we only intend this to be published by the end of 2021. And well, I guess that Carolina was just finishing what she was saying, inviting everybody here to actually join the conversation. And of course, we'll be open to uh, share whatever more do you think it will be useful. I think this is just one of the, the projects that we as women in business and human rights field could think of, but I'm sure that we're gonna build together into creating other venues. Thank you, Elena. Дуже дуже дякую Даніла, дуже дякую Кароліна. І насправді сьогодні в цій презентації беруть участь декілько декілька авторок, які от зараз наразі входять до авторського колективу. І власне і Юля, яка сьогодні вже презентувала своє дослідження і її внесок в монографію, також буде стосуватися цифрової ери і бізнесу і прав людини в цифрову епоху. Але також до нас сьогодні доєдналася і Глорія Нугумі, яка, власне, представляє Кенію і Дестині Кебур, Кебур со, вибачте, Кебірунгі. Я тренувалася, але для мене, бачите, це також, те, що ми представляємо різні регіони і звикли до різних імен, це також може бути проблемою. І Тетяна Зінович, яка представляє Казахстан. І, власне, я б зараз дуже хотіла надати слово пані Дестині, щоб вона якраз розказала, до якої теми вона звернулася і чому саме цю тему вона хоче хоче презентувати як от дослідниця в сфері бізнесу і прав людини і з якими, можливо, бар'єрами, які бар'єри у своїй академічній діяльності вона, можливо, відчуває чи навпаки вважає, що таких бар'єрів, можливо, не існує. Тому, будь ласка, пані Дестіні, вам слово. Дякую. Hi, uh, sorry, I'll just um, share my screen. Hi, everyone. I'm just trying to check if you can actually see the presentation. Oh, okay. So uh, I just yes, want yes, uh, ever since. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Professor Elena for inviting me to be a part of this prestigious event. And today I will be talking about a project I'm actually working on, which um, I believe Daniela and Carolina have actually mentioned. Um, it's to do with the Business and Human Rights book. So I'll be Sorry. So I'll be discussing um, exploring the business and human rights environment for Ugandan women working in supply chains with a particular focus on how gender intertwines with the business and human rights environment. So the emerging area of business and human rights in international law seeks in part to address the power disparity between developed countries, multinational corporations and developing world societies and attempts to deal with this power disparity have ironically sidelined another well-documented documented imba imbalance of power, which is gender inequality. Now, gender inequality is, is one of the oldest manifestations of discrimination, and it remains a significant barrier for women within the business and human rights environment. One thing to note is that women are an essential part of global supply chains, especially women from developing countries. And within supply chains, women work as raw material producers, small business owners, executives, just to, to mention but a few. 
And this presentation will focus on the UN guiding principles, the relationship between CIDAO and business and human rights, what role multinational corporations play in changing harmful social norms that affect the livelihood of Ugandan women working in supply chains, limitations faced by women in attaining equality and recommendations, in other words, what more needs to be done. The international law discussion regarding multinational corporations and human rights now oscillates around the protect, respect and remedy framework. The guiding principles are grounded under three pillars, the state duty to protect, the corporate responsibility to respect and access to effective remedies to address the gap between law and practice. I will focus on pillars one and two since I'll be addressing gender issues and I'll also follow the gender guidance for the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. Under the first principle, states must take appropriate States must take appropriate steps to ensure that all business enterprises operating within their territory or jurisdiction respect women's rights. The second principle notes that states should not only provide guidance, but also create incentives and disincentives to encourage all business enterprises domiciled within their territory. Uganda is a party to a number of international instruments which espouse the non-discrimination principle. And these include the International Covenant on Social and Cultural Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, and the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, among others. All these instruments oblige states to ensure that everyone without discrimination enjoys the covenant set forth, and these include gender, issue, gender equality. I've already mentioned earlier that within supply chains, women do play a major role. And one thing to note is that women working in the informal sector are amongst those at risk to have their rights violated. I'll discuss, uh, I'll talk more on this in um, later slides. Within these international instruments, this presentation will focus specifically on CIDAO. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, CIDAO creates clear guidelines that prohibit discrimination for instance, Article 4 of the Convention allows for states to adopt temporary special measures to accelerate equality between men and women without being considered discriminatory. Article 11 requires states to take all appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women in the field of employment in order to ensure on the basis of equality of men and women the same rights. CIDAO further requires states to take positive steps to ensure that corporations do not unfairly dismiss women employees on grounds of pregnancy, marital status, or family responsibilities. Uganda ratified the CIDAO Convention on the 22nd of July, 1985, and upon ratification in 1995, it, domest it domesticated the provisions of CIDAO within its constitution. In the previous slide, I mentioned that Article 11 requires states to take all appropriate measures to eliminate discrimination against women. And so far, Uganda has adopted the Gender Equality Seal for public and private enterprises, which is a corporate certification process that recognizes the good performance of UNDP country offices in delivering transformational gender equality results. It trusts on the insight that increasing synergies between different domains of gender mainstreaming can catalyze both organizational transformation and development results. It's important to note that Uganda was the first country in Africa to endorse the gender equality seal for private enterprises. Uganda has also set up the Equal Opportunities Commission under Article 32 of the Constitution of Uganda and the Equal Opportunities Act and it is mandated to eliminate discrimination and inequalities against any individual or group of persons. And its mandate is, sorry, its mandate is wide and it extends to private businesses and enterprises. So now I'll discuss um, pillar two in regards to corporate responsibility to protect. Underlying the second pillar, is the notion that business enterprises should avoid infringing on human rights of others and should address adverse human rights impacts with which they're involved in. It seems a reasonable requirement that a corporation that operates either directly through a subsidiary in a foreign jurisdiction should be subject to the highest standard of gender equality in its operations. 
To the question I raised in the beginning on whether corporations can play a role in changing harmful social norms, the answer is yes. In operational contexts where gender inequality prevails, corporations have a role to play by using their leverage to promote gender equality inside and outside the fence, but not alone. Now, guiding principle 11 notes that business enterprises have a responsibility to avoid infringing women's rights. And guiding principle 13 notes that business enterprises should not cause or contribute to adverse impacts on women's human rights and should address such, right, and should address such impacts when they occur. They should take adequate measures to prevent or mitigate adverse impacts on women's human rights that are directly linked to their operations, products or services by their business relationships. Guiding principle 14 points out that all business enterprises, including micro, small and medium sized enterprises, should take appropriate steps in line with the guiding principles to respect the human rights of women, including those working in the informal economy. So guiding principle 14 notes that business enterprises should map workers in the informal economy who are part of their supply chains, identify the gender specific issues and take appropriate steps to address these issues. The informal sector is often dangerous and susceptible to exploitation since it's dominated by women. Um, for instance, in the agriculture industry, women in Uganda grow somewhere between 70 and 80% of the food generating most of the income for many of the families. Multinational corporations should also include sector specific considerations in addressing whether their actions create, encourage, reinforce or exacerbate existing gender based inequalities. Um, just to add more on this, um, it, there's evidence to show that the challenges that women might face in um, the agricultural industries could be different from what women face in mining industries. So that's why multinational corporations should include spe sector specific uh, considerations. Listen, listen, sorry to interrupt you. Who do you, who do you share the full screen? The full what, sorry? Oh, the full screen. Sorry, pardon? Sorry, what was your question, Elena? I, I didn't get it the first time. Um, if you could uh, share with us full screen. Oh, um, it shows that I'm sharing the full screen. <laughs> um, uh, okay, okay, but um, we can uh, suggest um, half of the screen. Oh, okay. Um, let me end the slideshow and do. Is this better? A little bit, yes. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. I don't know how to change it. Okay. No, no, it's okay. Okay. It's, um, <laughs> it works as well. Okay, sorry about that. Um, I believe I was on slide 15. Sorry, for my economy. Yeah. So, uh, I'll talk briefly about the guiding principles 15, 16 and 17. So, principle Sorry, I've lost where I was. Yes, yeah, I found it. So in guiding principle 15, business enterprises should integrate the gender framework and guidance in all policies and, process, and processes put in place to implement all aspects of their responsibility to respect human rights under the guiding principles uh, principle 16 notes that businesses should embed their commitment to respect women's human rights. For example, as of August 2019, about 41 countries operating in Uganda had committed to the UNGP gender equality seal. And principle 17 points out that 
business enterprises should explicitly integrate a gender perspective in carrying out all steps of human rights due diligence as per the guiding principles. Um, some of the limitations faced by women in attaining equality, uh, I'll talk about eco pay for eco work first. One major issue that continues to inform public concern is one of eco pay for eco work, especially the gender pay gaps. The 1997 gender policy text cognizance of the fact that Uganda is a patriarchal society where men are dominant players in decision making. Although women shoulder most reproductive, productive and community management responsibilities, many of which are not remunerated or reflected in national statistics. Another limitation faced by women is maternity leave. Now, the Article 33 of the Ugandan Constitution recognizes the need to protect maternal functions of women, including reproduction, and Article 33 prohibits laws, cultures, customs, or traditions which are against the dignity, welfare, or interests of women, or which undermine their status. Section 56 of the Employment Act 2006 provides for maternity leave. Subsection 1 of Section 56 is to the effect that a female employee shall as a consequence shall as a consequence of pregnancy have the right to a period of 60 working days leave from work on full wages hereafter referred to as maternity leave of which at least four weeks shall allow shall follow the childbirth or miscarriage however the situation is not that promising within the informal sector since the constitution makes no provision for maternity leave beyond provisions within the formal employment sector most of these employees do not have security of tenure and often walk through their pregnancies with little or no protection. Fears of loss of jobs force them not to take leave. In fact, case studies within the flower farm industries share a dark light on this, where women cannot attempt to apply for maternity leave as it can lead to termination of employment. And in some cases where they take a few days during their pregnancy, it will be deducted from annual leave or it will be looked at as days taken off without pay. Now, internationally, the ILO, the ILO Convention offers maternity leave as one form of contingency that must be undertaken with a broader social protection measures in place for all workers. The ILO Maternity Protection Convention 2000 greatly broadens the scope around social protection of women in the workforce and is designed to promote equality of all women in the workforce and the health and safety of the mother and child. The convention spells out specific provisions for extending maternity protection to all women workers, including those within the informal economy and those engaged in atypical forms of dependent work. However, Uganda has not ratified the convention and is yet to strengthen provisions advancing maternity leave protections beyond the formal sector. All in all, although Uganda has a policy framework on maternal and child health rights, the national legal framework does not explicitly address the issue of maternity leave within the informal sector. It is therefore very difficult to enforce maternity leave for women who work in informal sectors where neither formal work agreements nor trade unions exist. Um, some other limitations faced by women are governance gaps between developed and developing countries, which often result in inconsistencies between gender equality in the workplace of a corporation's home state and that in the workplace of its host state. These governance gaps allow for the exploitation of women in host state countries in a manner that would be unlawful in the home state of the corporation. As is widely documented, host states often fail to provide effective statutory and other protection against such exploitation. Um, I've just mentioned how, for instance, um, there's no maternity leave cover for women working within the informal sector. So, Host states do fail to provide effective statutory and other protection against such exploitation, clearly failing in their duty to protect against the violation in Talia, um, Article 11 of CEDAW. And emerging evidence of the impact of COVID-19 suggests that women's economic and productive lives have been affected disproportionately and differently for men, since the informal sector, as mentioned before, is made up of women predominantly. This means that they have less access to social protections and their capacity to absorb economic shocks is therefore less than that of men. So 
in most of the slides while discussing the issues faced by women, I have... Dear Destiny, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but could you analyze because um, we have a real lack of time. Thank sorry, this, this is my final slide. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, in addressing what more can be done, um, the Uganda National Action Plan on Business and Human Rights should pay special attention to the unique circumstances and experiences of vulnerable and marginalized sections of people in society. For instance, addressing um, women and the issues of inequality. And also most states and enterprises still pay little or inadequate attention to the diverse experiences of women implement, implementing their respective duties and responsibilities under the guiding principles. To eliminate all forms of discrimination against women and achieve substantive gender equality, Uganda as a state and business enterprises should work together with women's organizations and all other relevant actors to ensure systematic changes to discriminatory power structures, social norms and hostile environments that are barriers to women's equal enjoyment of human rights in all spheres. The proposed gender framework and guidance provide concrete steps on how this can be done. For example, business enterprises provide support and use their leverage to ensure that their, part, their business partners apply the gender framework and guidance in the operations that respect human rights. The quick spread of COVID-19 has highlighted the extent to which we live in a global village where producing countries immediately feel decreases in demand while importing countries might struggle to get supplies. This is an opportunity to reflect on the way businesses operate within supply chains. It's time for a new system. We need supply chains in which everyone is acknowledged for their contribution. Wall should be more equally distributed and women should be treated equally. Everybody in the supply chain should earn at least a living wage and it, this will make people more resilient and supply chains more sustainable and fairer. So in conclusion, it's time to change the paradigm and to understand that profound transformation of the system will only be possible if we recognize that substantive equality is key to socioeconomic justice there is no democracy without women. Thank you so much for listening. Я дуже дуже дякую. Це надзвичайно цікава презентація, надзвичайно цікаве дослідження. І чесно кажучи, я вже зараз хочу почитати цю книгу, яка має вийти. Дякую дуже Дестині, що ти що ви представили свої результати досліджень. І я також хочу надати слово пані Тетяні Зяновичу. Вона працює над тематикою бізнесу і прав людини і власне починала працювати і зараз працює над соціальною відповідальністю бізнесу і також долучилася до роботи над цією публікацією, над цією книгою і вона представляє Казахстан і а, дуже цікаво почути а, чим було зумовлено вибір її теми і чому вона власне погодилася взяти участь в цій ініціативі, ну окрім моїх вмовлянь звичайно. Добрый день. Меня видно, слышно? Слышно, но пока не видно. Не видно. Ну, я вроде бы включила видео. Угу. Вот видно. Спасибо. Спасибо большое. Я хотела бы поблагодарить организаторов этой инициативы, этого мероприятия за то, что вы предоставили мне возможность внести вклад в такую важную публикацию и в сегодняшнее мероприятие. И хотела бы рассказать о том, как, какой, что именно мы хотели бы озвучить от имени женщин Казахстана, которые занимаются бизнесом и правами человека, и которые являются частью бизнеса и прав человека. И мы хотели свое исследование посвятить вопросу бизнес такому вопросу, бизнес или права человека в Казахстане, то есть как женщины вынуждены делать трудный выбор между корпоративной карьерой и правом на семейную жизнь. В рамках подготовки этого исследования я обратилась к своей коллеге, это Халида Жигулова, она является PhD университета ЛСТР и занимается вопросами гендерного равенства в Казахстане. 
И мы хотели исследовать проблему непредставленности женщин в Казахстане на руководящих должностях в корпоративном секторе крупных предприятий. Ну вот согласно статистике в прошлого года только 24% женщин были исполнительными директорами или главами исполнительных советов казахстанских банков, например. И в трех крупнейших квазигосударственных холдинговых корпорациях Казахстана это Самру Казана, Казагра, Байтерек. Женщины не занимали должности генерального директора, и только 28% женщин занимали другие руководящие должности. Но в то же время на уровне индивидуальных предпринимателей, малых и средних предприятий доля женщин-директоров составляла около 50%. С одной стороны, это можно рассматривать как положительную сторону и заключающуюся в очевидном равенстве женщин-предпринимателей и мужчин-предпринимателей на уровне малого и среднего бизнеса в нашей стране. Но принимая во внимание недостаточную представленность женщин-руководителей высшего звена на крупных предприятиях, ситуация может фактически относиться к барьеру так называемого стеклянного потолка когда женщины не получают равных возможностей для продвижения на высшие руководящие должности и вынуждены уволиться и начать, например, свой собственный малый бизнес. Мы хотели бы как раз-таки проанализировать эту проблему и собрать эмпирические данные о женской рабочей силе в Казахстане и в связи с этим мы будем организовывать экспертные интервью с женщинами, которые заняты в малом, среднем, в крупном бизнесе, а также с теми женщинами, которые занимаются неоплачиваемым домашним трудом. И мы рассматриваем такую гипотезу, что в какой степени права женщин на семью и детей, которые гарантированы Конституцией Казахстана, нарушаются недобросовестными владельцами, руководителями бизнеса, которые несправедливо отказывают женщинам с детьми и семейными обязанностями в продвижении по службе. Мы убеждены, что существующие условия работы, они должны измениться, чтобы стать более гибкими, с возможностью работать из дома, чтобы удовлетворять потребности матерей, которые ухаживают за детьми. И такие гибкие механизмы, они помогут создать более инклюзивную рабочую среду и предоставят возможности трудоустройства не только для женщин, но и для других членов общества, которые в равной степени нуждаются в более гибких условиях труда, включая людей с ограниченными возможностями, женщин и мужчин, которые заботятся о своих нуждах, о детях, о пожилых родителях или родственников. И в долгосрочной перспективе мы оценим, что такие договоренности могут улучшить баланс между работой и личной жизнью и в то же время повысить удовлетворенность работы всех сотрудников и таким образом, естественно, повысить продуктивность бизнеса. Ну, сегодня в нашей стране тема бизнеса и прав человека не очень популярна. И мы рассчитываем на то, что вот такие инициативы, которые мы обсуждаем с вами здесь и сейчас, они будут носить существенный вклад в то, чтобы правительство, бизнес-сектор и общественные организации все чаще и чаще обращали свое внимание на развитие ответственного ведения бизнеса как части устойчивого развития. И ну, мы выражаем надежду, что эта, эта публикация, эта книга, она будет иметь широкий большой резонанс и внесет существенный вклад в изменение ситуации в наших странах. Спасибо большое. Спасибо огромное, Татьяна. Дуже, дуже дякуємо. Дійсно, я сподіваюся, що вдасться представити різний регіональний досвід і досліджень в сфері бізнесу і прав людини. І, власне, хоча ця книга і не задумувалася, як така, що має відображати різні аспекти гендерної рівності, захисту прав жінок в різних регіонах, а представити да, жінок як дослідниць, 
міць в сфері бізнесу прав людини, але все рівно, так чи інакше, все рівно гендерна, гендерний порядок денний не може не відобразитися да, на змісті цієї книги, тому, звичайно, це також тематика, це також буде відображена в цій публікації, чому я насправді дуже радію. Якщо є питання, коментарі, можливо, виникли а, упродовж а, власне, цього обговорення, а, можливо, Юля хоче додати, чому, що її спонукало доєднатися до авторського колективу? Так, дякую. Власне, я вважаю, що це чудова ідея надати голоси жінкам, як дослідницям, як людям, які професійно займаються темою бізнесу і прав людини. І я одразу ж, коли почула про таку можливість, вирішила, що я неодмінно подам свої пропозиції. Ну, власне, моє дослідження стосується прав людини у цифрову епоху, чи залишається місце для прав людини між інтересами корпорацій і е, цифровими технологіями. І я сподіваюся, що це буде чудова книжка. Я теж сьогодні вже почула всі ці презентації, які звучали, і дуже хочу прочитати її якнайскоріше. Дякую дуже. Можливо, якщо немає, власне, запитань чи коментарів, на жаль, до нас ще мала доєднатися пані Харпет Каур. Це жінка, якою я щиро захоплююся. Вона представляє UNDP в Азії і якраз розділ UNDP в Азії, який займається питаннями бізнесу і прав людини. Якісь виникли технічні проблеми, тому що вона саме зараз намагається вже декілька разів до нас доєднатися, але через якісь технічні проблеми не вдається це це зробити. Але е, я сподіваюся, що вона також буде у цьому авторському колективі і е, також представить своє бачення цієї проблематики, е, тому що насправді UNDP в Азії, саме департамент з бізнесу і прав людини робить дуже багато цікавих захоплюючих ініціатив і хотілося б розвивати цю співпрацю і знаходити точки перетинання, які дозволять обмінюватися цим досвідом Свідомо відповідними ініціативами доєднуватися до цих ініціатив. І я також хочу сказати, що насправді дійсно важливо знаходити ті можливі формати, за допомогою яких жінки можуть ставати ну, більш видимими да, в тих чи інших сферах діяльності. І буквально вчора одна з моїх колег, яка також займається бізнесом і правами людини і є викладачкою в Голландії, вона поділилася а, початком, започаткуванням своєї ініціативи зробити а, таку мережу а, жінок дослідниць в сфері бізнесу і прав людини, а, і також щоб давало можливість обмінюватися інформацією, обмінюватися ініціативами, ну і таким чином підтримувати а, одна одну. Ну, я бачу скептичний погляд Віктора Семеновича, який, напевно, мріє створити таку ж мережу дослід в сфері бізнесу і прав людини. І вже я бачу, що він шукає варіанти, як це можна зробити. Я щиро дякую всім нашим панелісткам. О, до нас доєдналася пані Харпет Каур. Це надзвичайно, надзвичайно велика вдача для нас. І я з задоволенням надаю слово пані Харпет. Щиро вітаємо, будь ласка, Ваше слово. Thanks, Elena. Uh, I hope you can hear me. And I'm really sorry we've had some technical difficulties in connecting. Um, but thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, thank you. I will really look forward to uh, you know, tuning into some of your sessions. Um, you know, when actually, you know, when I started preparing for the session today, I was just thinking of my own experience, you know, uh, for organizing the Responsible Business and Human Rights Forum, which is the Asia Regional Forum that we organize every year. And uh, because of, you know, because of COVID-19, we obviously had to take this online and you know, we've had, uh, we've had about 201 speaking roles and, you know, majority of these were women. 
but I was just reflecting back on my experience. You know, uh, we had some sessions on bringing in women academics because. Uh, we're even at the annual forum, we don't see many women academics or, you know, contributing to the annual forum on business and human rights in Geneva. And we're really trying to sort of bring in more, uh, you know, more uh, academics. And I don't forget about even sort of women academics, which was just started, you know, expanding the business and human rights space to the academics uh, and particularly the regional forums. I, you know, I, and I'm, and I'm from India, you know, a country that, that big, and, you know, we were, I was, I was able to only get one woman academic from business and human rights space to the regional forum. And, you know, that kind of, and, and it's not that we did not look enough, you know, we really sort of did try to reach out and you know, we did try to sort of look for uh, more women in academia, sort of working on sensitive human rights issues. And it's just a handful of women that, you know, we were able to sort of identify and, you know, uh, and, and very few were available to speak at that point of time. And I think and that's what sort of really got me reflecting in terms of, you know, how gender diversity and inclusion at the workplace, particularly in the corporate sector, has been researched extensively in the region, spoken about and covered extensively in the media, particularly in Asia. But higher education kind of, you know, remains really largely untouched. Uh, I mean, of course, and you know, we were just kind of thinking about because the data indicates that women seemingly far outnumber men in the teaching fraternity, at least in Asia. Uh, but however, many of them, uh, you know, but, but if you really do uh, sort of analyze the data closely, we realize how women in uh, higher education sector remain uh, really restricted to the middle ranking positions. Uh, and then, you know, we, we really, we barely, you know, find women who are vice chancellors or, you know, they do make, I mean, some of them have made it to the head of departments, but at registrars and teams, but we really, uh, really uh, as, as vice chancellor. In fact, I was looking at this, some data recently, less than 1% of universities in India ever had a female vice chancellor. Uh, you know, again, less than 7% team and even less than 6% female directors across 73 institutes of national importance. And I think that kind of talks about, you know, the lack of women, women in leadership positions in the higher academia and and, and therefore the lack of mentors and the role models to look up, you know, for uh, for younger generations, for younger academics, for younger women academics in, uh, in you know, and then sort of they really don't find those many uh, leaders and those many role models in the space. And I think that's, uh, you know, thank you for also sort of bringing in these conversations about, you know, uh, and I think that's that's how, you know, perhaps Daniel's idea of, you know, the idea of sort of bringing in this monograph came in. Uh, but I think, um, but I think we're really sort of trying to look from through this book is through this through this monograph is really to be able to bring together experiences of women who are working in the business and human rights space, both in academics and professional. But but have we really looked at uh, many of these business and human rights issues from a woman's perspective? And I think that uh, that could be a great contribution to the field in itself because the intersectionality and the challenges that we see through our own eyes and our own experiences you know particularly you're looking at COVID and you know, all of us are working uh, and managing uh, the double you know the double you know the already existence uh, double burden of care work and how you know how these how the situations have been uh, exacerbated by the by the COVID-19 and pandemic like the COVID-19 I think that's kind of really sort of talks about uh, talks about the need for for us to research more, talk more, and bring to the light more uh, issues about and the challenges that women face, uh, you know, women face in this industry. But then also sort of work together to bring up uh, and to and to identify the solutions and, and you know come up with um, hopefully uh, you know hopefully big ideas that help change uh, change the scenario on the ground. Um, and I'll stop there with, with my opening remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's um, extremely important for us to have you with us today and thank you for your support and assistance. Um, і, власне, зараз ми маємо завершити цю частину. Я хочу дуже подякувати усім учасницям цієї презентації, окремо подякувати Даніелі і Кароліні, власне, за саму ідею, подякувати Дестині, подякувати Харпет, подякувати Тетяні, які представили свої ідеї, підтримали цю ініціативу, подякувати Юлії. 
І в нас такий логічний, на мій погляд, наступний крок, тому що наступний наш захід, він присвячений жінкам, які є правозахисницями в сфері бізнесу і прав людини. І я хочу передати слово для модерування цього заходу Марії Ясиновській, яка зараз гордо йде на місце модераторки. Будь ласка, пані Марія, вона і сама може сміливо називатися правозахисницею в сфері бізнесу і прав людини, але сьогодні в неї інша роль, в неї роль модераторки. Дякую ще раз дуже всім. Добре. А, ну тоді, якщо я з рукою на програму, тоді я можу починати. Друзі, добрий вечір. Рада всіх вітати в цьому залі. Наша організація «Харківська обласна фундація «Громадська альтернатива» вже не вперше виступає партнером окремих заходів, які відбуваються в рамках міжнародного юридичного форуму. І ми дуже пишаємося цією співпрацею і, зокрема, співпрацю з експертами Національного юридичного університету імені Ярослава Мудрого і з пані Оленою, з пані Юлією, які якраз сидять поряд зі мною. І я хочу сказати, що наша організація є частиною такого величезного процесу, який відбувається на просторі ОБСЄ, який називається... Ну, це взагалі-то міжнародна коаліція, але називається вона міжнародна платформа громадянської солідарності, об'єднує організації з різних країн. А, дякую. З різних країн ОБСЄ. І наша організація, зокрема, входить до складу робочої групи, яка працює з питання просування прав жінок та гендерної рівності. І цього року наша робоча група обрала для себе напрямок, якраз пов'язаний з підвищенням видимості, підвищенням розуміння ролі та внеску, який роблять жінки-правозахисниці в різні аспекти просування захисту прав людини в різних країнах і в різних сферах. Наша організація була рада долучитися до цього спільного процесу, і ми обрали ті дві теми, які близькі саме для нас. Це права людей з інвалідністю і права людини в контексті взаємин з бізнес-середовищем. І ми вирішили показати, зокрема те, що стосується нашого сьогоднішнього заходу, що жінки, які є правозахисницями, вони дійсно зробили дуже багато для становлення стандартів сфери бізнесу та права людини і сильно посприяли тому, щоб негативний вплив бізнесу на права людини, який дуже часто відбувається, він був зменшений, щоб питання цієї проблематики почало ставати предметом суспільної дискусії і щоб випрацьовувалися механізми захисту людини в подібних ситуаціях. І ми почали збирати різні історії жінок з різних країн, які саме вплинули на бізнес в сторону покращення дотримання ним прав людини. І сьогодні ми якраз про це і хочемо поговорити, і в нас є сім гостей з різних країн, в нас є гості, ну безумовно, з України, з Німеччини, з Швейцарії, так, з Словаччини вже немає, а є, а добре, добре, Ага, так, з Вірменії, вибачте, і зараз я буду поступово їм надавати слово, в нас є достатньо часу для того, щоб поспілкуватися з нашими гостями, і я пропоную, щоб спочатку 
жінки, яких ми запросили розповісти про свій внесок або про внесок жінок, які живуть в їх країнах саме в цю тему. Я пропоную спочатку послухати гостей, а потім задати питання. І якщо в нас вийде, то буде здорово мати невелику дискусію стосовно цього. Ну і першою я хочу надати слово пані Катерині Левченко, яка до нас приєднається через Zoom. Пані Катерина вже з нами. Ну, я нагадую, що пані Катерина Левченко є урядовою повноваженою з питань гендерної політики і є саме однією з тих жінок, які зробили дуже багато в сфері просування гендерної рівності, прав жінок в Україні. І це дуже відома постать на протязі останніх, ну, я вважаю, напевно, десь приблизно 20 років. І те, що саме вона зараз є гендерною повноваженою, це, ну, Ага, пані Катерини немає. Ну, це такі технічні моменти, все буває в нашому житті. Тоді давайте перейдемо до наступної спікерки. І якщо пані Катерина до нас повернеться, то ми їй обов'язково відразу надамо слово. Але спочатку, так, а... Еріка Джордж, професорка Центру прав людини, президентка програми лідерства, коледж права SJ Куіні університету Юта США. І, будь ласка, я хочу від себе додати, що професорка Еріка Джордж якраз була тією, тією гостинною людиною, яка підтримала мене під час фулбрайтівської програми в університеті Юти. І я надзвичайно вдячна їй і її команді, тому що це просто на той час перебування в Юті, вони стали дійсно другою родиною. Я досі відчуваю цю підтримку і це добре ставлення. Дуже-дуже дякую і дуже рада можливості вас сьогодні побачити. Будь ласка, пані Еріка, вам слово. Wonderful. Okay, I don't speak a word of Ukrainian, but um, I can just feel the... The, the wonder of seeing Olena again. As she mentioned, she was with us um, on a Fulbright that was cut too short by conditions. Um, it was our true pleasure to host her, and I hope when the world reopens, we can convene together again in person. Um, we share an interest on, on women's equality, and I've been asked to talk on um, women who are changing the world and women's human rights defenders. I'm going to try to share my screen, and I'd like to share a story that's, um, well, relatively recent, but ongoing. So, let's see if that should work. Okay, we've been talking um, today about the role of women in the business and human rights movement. And I wanted to tell the story of a woman, this is centered in the US, but I think a cautionary tale for many countries that are confronting similar issues. I wanted to begin where we began, which was with the two men who shaped the foundation of the policy instrument that much of our work operates around. You'll recall that Kofi Annan appointed John Ruggie when he was the um, Secretary General of the United Nations. He appointed an academic, John Ruggie, to look into what role business had in human rights violations, international human rights violations. Um, I share this slide because as you many, many of you will know, we still have never had a woman um, Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, that is something that we hope will happen. And when the framework that Professor Ruggi constructed was put in place, there is an explicit reference to gender or women in the document at all but it incorporates by reference other human rights instruments. We know now that it is important to protect human rights, that it's important to respect human rights, and that victims are entitled to a remedy. Um, the story I want to talk about today fails on each of the three pillars um, that were erected in this policy instrument on the UN Guiding Principles of Business and Human Rights. We know that a state is responsible for protecting the people within its jurisdiction. I will be talking about the United States and the failure of the government to protect people within its jurisdiction. 
um, and I won't be talking about citizens, I'll be talking about migrants. Um, the failure to respect human rights. Much of the human rights infrastructure in the United States has come under assault. And to the extent that we are regulating our migration, that's been privatized and placed in the hands of not just the government, but also private businesses, enterprises, and corporations that have failed to respect the human rights of migrants. And then finally, I'll talk a bit about remedy. Um, people who are in immigrant detention in the United States who do not have access to remedy to um, claim their rights aside from avoiding deportation, but the very conditions in which we are holding them um, are deeply problematic and contrary to all the human rights obligations that the United States has agreed to protect by becoming a signatory to the international covenants. So, um, as you may know, the United States has situated immigration as a highly contested political issue. The current administration of my country um, largely rose to power arguing for a wall or a barrier to be erected at our southern border. Our neighbors to the south um, are Mex is Mexico, and migrants coming into the United States from the southern border tend to not be white. Um, we are having a rising white supremacist movement gaining power throughout our government and our society, and one of the political chess pieces played um, are the lives of migrant people. Um, much of the migration to the United States is either asylum seeking, which is not a crime, seeking asylum in a different nation, or it's economic migrant labor. So touching on the business issue, these would potentially be em people employed by other business enterprises, whether that's large um, agricultural business, whether that's manufacturing, um, people are migrating into the United States for access to opportunity. Um, and they are being stopped at the border and in line, inland by a federal agency that is increased in influence and in um, resources, the Border Control and Customs, which is now called ICE, Immigration Control and Enforcement, a, a subsection of our Department of Homeland Security. So we've securitized the border, we've criminalized migration, and we've done so um, through public-private partnerships. So there's more underneath ICE. So ICE is just the tip of the iceberg, what is public facing in government. What's beneath that is a network of private companies that form the infrastructure of um, immigrant detention, immigrant enforcement, and the problem that I'm going to talk about and the woman who raised the alarm. Um, just for a bit of background, um, the Migration Policy Institute has been studying the profits that are flowing from immigration enforcement and the role of private prisons in U.S. immigration detention. There's a clear business nexus and link um, that's counter to incentivizing protect for human, protection for human rights. Um, far from protection, we're seeing profiting. Um, in the last several decades, since 1995, the population in immigrant detention has more than tripled. Um, business is booming under the current administration. Um, up to 75% of people in immigrant detention are held not in a state facility or a government facility, but a private facility that is making profit off of their being in custody. Um, these businesses have been using three strategies to integrate into government um, policy favor so that they are privileged in getting detainees. One is contributing to political campaigns, the other is um, lobbying, and then building relationships and networks through private and public sectors. So I want to talk about this one woman. Um, just last week, Don Wooten came forward to describe a highly alarming number of forced hysterectomies performed on women in migrant detention. She learned over and over that Spanish speaking women were being sent from the facility to a medical doctor to have their uterus removed, their ovaries removed. Um, Dawn actually worked for one of these private companies until she came forward. Dawn worked at the Irwin Con County Correction Center which is owned by LaSalle and managed by LaSalle, one of the companies that contracted 
by the federal government to detain migrants. And at this Georgia facility, um, she exploded what was going on. Um, she's a licensed clinical nurse and she gained the trust of the detainees. Based on her whistleblowing, um, she is working to defend women's human rights. Um, this is a human rights issue that's multi-layered. You've got the most vulnerable people in our custody, in our jurisdiction, who are minority women, who are language minority women, who are migrant women or asylum seekers in detention that haven't had the opportunity to receive informed consent for procedures being done on their body. So this goes directly to the heart of the right to bodily integrity, the right to reproductive health and freedom, um, the right to due process. None of that is being done. Um, and this is being done in a dark cloud of private prison profiteering. So um, Don Wooten was able to collect information from the women in the detention center. And she told them that most of them, she, was, she learned that most of them were being sent to a single gynecologist. Um, he's been referred to as the uterus collector. He was removing ovaries. Um, everyone in Dawn's observation during the time that she was there, sent to have surgeries with this man, returned with a hysterectomy. So um, I'll read her words that are in a complaint filed by the Southern Project on the Institute to Elim Elim Eliminate Poverty and Genocide. With respect to this doctor, um, she became suspicious because it just didn't seem to her that everyone's uterus could be that bad um, and not everyone who's simply Spanish speaking. She says, everyone he sees has a, has a hysterectomy. He's even taken out the wrong ovary of a young lady, an immigrant woman detained. She was supposed to have her left ovary removed because it has a cyst. He took out the right one. She was upset, she had to go back. He took out the left. She wound up with a total hysterectomy. She wanted children. She said that she was not all the way out under the anesthesia. Um, she could tell what was happening to her, which sounds tantamount to torture. Another person, we've questioned among ourselves that he's taking everything out. He's a uterus collector. I know this sounds ugly, but is he collecting these things or something? Everyone he sees, everyone, he's taking out their uteruses or he's taking out their tubes. This is intertwined with the issue of not being able to have choice. Um, she also shared comments that she collected from the women detained. Um, one woman explains coming back, I felt like he was trying to mess with my body. When the hospital told her they couldn't operate because she was COVID positive, um, Dawn is also exposed failure to protect people against COVID. Um, she saw that people were being put in lockdown, further lockdown in solitary confinement to be punished for speaking. Um, when she spoke out, she was demoted. When she started asking questions, she was told that she was making problems. Um, and ultimately she was pushed out. Um, she started asking questions about these hysterectomies, about COVID-19 testing. And um, in departing, she said, you put two and two together. I'm asking for these things. I'm asking and speaking for these detainees. Now I'm the problem. I'm being seen and I'm not supposed to be seen or heard. It makes it look like you're not doing your job. They have driven away so many people who work here. Whenever anyone speaks out to do what is right, they are sent out. Um, so I wanted to talk about Dawn because I think it's particularly important who she is. Um, she's an African-American black woman born in Georgia, um, which is a place that has not been a stranger to this story. So while um, the US media is now talking about this, this is an important issue to talk about, the business layering on of disincentivizing true protection and care when it can be more profitable to ignore um, the spread of COVID-19 in these detention centers or the abuses that are occurring, um, there is much money to be made and profits have only increased. In this slide, I don't know if you can see it, um, Geo Group is the largest um, detention center followed by Civic Corps. The incidents that occurred um, in Irwin are owned by a company, LaSalle Corrections, which is just maybe the third largest in this slide. Um, but we have reason to believe, and the lawyers that have filed the complaint based on the whistleblower's allegations, 
suggests that this is not something unique, not something limited to Georgia. There are detention centers also in Louisiana, in Texas, in Florida. Um, and there's reason to believe that detainees are not being treated in accordance with what human rights would demand. Um, fortunately, this whistleblower is no longer alone. Um, we were talking about stories that have changed the world, and this is a story that continues. Um, since she came forward, um, she has been targeted. Um, she says that she's now a target and she is fine with being a target um, because she needed to speak out against what was an inhumane system. And since she spoke out, journalists researching have interviewed people who have bolstered um, her allegations. So we have reason to believe that they are credible allegations. Um, Wooten's account has been bolstered by interviews. Another member of the current medical staff who did not want to be named for fear of the retaliation that they witnessed um, Dawn going through, and four other current people detained in that facility have said that what she said is true. So others are talking about this now. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists that represent over 60,000 women's healthcare physicians have written a letter to the Inspector General in the United States calling her complaint alarming and urging an investigation. The Senate, I'm um, sorry, the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, which is the lower house of our elected legislative government in the United States, is also calling for a federal investigation into these allegations. So the significance of having a whistleblower call these issues into question